Take a chill pill, man. Number three. Number four. Thank you, Chicago, for this humbling victory. All I can say, you sure know how to make a guy feel at home. Yeah! Number six. And wake up. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. TGIF, buddy. Mm-hmm. All right. It's the Ben Jarofsky Show your, for your Friday, May 17th is moments away. But before we get into that, we would like to thank the following unions. Wait, hold on. Let me turn on the video here. All right. There we are. We're on video. We'd like to thank the following unions for jumping on board and bringing back the Ben Jarofsky Show. First up, it's the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8. The International Brotherhood of... Uh, oh, lost my place there. International Brotherhood... Where the hell did it go? Oh, yeah, of electrical workers, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. Big thank you to those unions for jumping on board and bringing back the Ben Jarofsky Show. And, of course, today's program is brought to you by our friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. The Ben Jarofsky Show starts now. It is Friday, May 17th, and live from the Chicago Sun-Times Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, it's another Ramana Rundown with Sun-Times editor Ramana Hussein. We welcome back our Chicago Reader colleague, Maya Dukmasova, and it's In These Times writer, Micah Utrecht. And now your host, Chicago Reader columnist, Ben Jarofsky. Hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this Old Man River Friday. And here's... Well, so it's about you. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, despite the unspeakable gloom, doom, and horror that fills the front pages of my newspapers every day, I've come to the realization that fills me with hope. I am old. Okay, being old, this is not in and of itself filled me with hope, but I'll get to that. But I am old. How old? (laughs) I'm so old that I remember that when people go, oh, how old? That's from Johnny Carson. Did you know that, D? I did not know that. Also from Johnny Carson. Man, if it wasn't for Johnny Carson, I wouldn't have any stuff. He was the best there was, D, and don't forget that, all right? How old? I'm so old that I know what this song is. Ding, 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 ding. You know what that one is, D? Oh, uh, Bonanza? How'd you know that? I know Bonanza. Oh, my God. I'm so old, I know Petticoat Junction. Oh, now that's really old. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's super old. I love Petticoat Junction. I'm Hang tight, like, <laughs> I'm so old that I saw the original Shaft at the Howard Theater back in the early 1970s, and after the show was over, I went around rewriting the song. In the song they go, they say that cat Shaft's a bad mother. Shut your mouth. I'm talking about Shaft. I turned it in. They say that cat Benny is a bad mother. Shut your mouth. Oh. Anyway, that's I know how- you didn't have to admit that, right? <laughs> I am so old, I'm like that river, Old Man River. In fact, I know the song, Old Man River. Old 
man river he keeps on rolling. Why are you singing? <laughs> anyway. So, you ask, what does old have to do with filling me with hope? Great question. Thank you for asking that, Dr. D. Because I realize that the precepts that people of my generation subscribe to are not carved in stone and they won't be around forever. Just because we believe something is true doesn't mean it actually is. We got all kinds of people that walk through that door every day to talk to us about politics and their world, their political worldviews and what they expect and hope for from politicians. Uh, some are older than me, hello Klonsky brothers, but many, many are of the younger persuasion. Just this week, Kim Ortiz, uh, Maya Dukmasova, uh, Defran Smart, Maya, by, by the way, will be right back here on Friday in about an hour or so. And the thing is, they're all, you know, what, in their late 20s or so. Uh, the thing about them is they just don't have the same preconceptions that I do. They don't, for instance, think that it's abnormal or outrageous to insist that our taxes go to a national health care plan as opposed to building a wall in the desert that does no good for anyone or fighting a war in the Middle East or, I don't know, just on the local level, building an upscale community in an already gentrifying neighborhood that doesn't need the subsidy. Back in 2016, I voted for Bernie, but I did so thinking there is no way he could win in a general election, given the fact that he is just so unabashedly, what, liberal to the point of being a socialist? But more and more, I'm starting to realize that the worldviews and the fears and the hopelessness that sort of mark my generation are old and outdated. They're as old and outdated as that bonanza theme. Ding, 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 We got a great show today, everybody. Yes, yes, yes. Ramana Hussein will be here for the weekly Ramana Rundown. More gloom, doom, and hopelessness for him. Oh, right. Way to keep him on. <laughs> Way to keep him listening, Oh, Benny. my God. Hey, you're going to be bummed out. <laughs> the news is pretty outrageous here in the city of Chicago, but Ramana uh, always has some in, uh, very uh, important insights. Uh, Maya Dukmasova will be here again. Uh, Dukmasova. What did I say? Duke Masova. Da Duke Masova. There you go. Okay, she's got a great, great cover story in the reader, folks, about evictions. Man, Maya took the deep dive, and we'll be taking the deep dive with her. And then um, uh, Michael Utrich will be here from Jacobin Magazine, and in these times, and we'll be talking Bernie politics. I'm going to talk Maya into sitting around. We're going to have a great, we're going to close down the show with some superior political talk national politics, local politics, state politics, you name it, every kind of politics in the world. But before we do any of that, you know what we're gonna do, D? What? I'm gonna turn it over to you for the news. Me? Yeah, man, it's oh. your turn, here's the ball. Don't be afraid to shoot it like the Portland Trailblazers right. last night. Thank you for the ball, no sports talk. All right, <laughs> okay. people, it's the middle of the final day of the week. Let's find out what's happening in the national news this afternoon. Well, we talked about it yesterday. New York Mayor Bill de Blasio running for president in 2020. Brother. Ben, what were your thoughts on that again? <laughs> I'm like, why are you wasting our time, de Blasio? Big de Blasio fan he is. <laughs> well, uh, President Donald Trump is weighed in oh, here. He saw it. <laughs> Here's President Trump wishing New York Mayor Bill de Blasio good luck on his 2020 bid. I can't believe it. I just heard that the worst mayor in the history of New York City, and without question, the worst mayor in the United States, is now running for president. It will never happen. I'm pretty good at predicting things like that. I would be very surprised to see him in there for a long period, but it's just not going to happen. If you like high taxes and if you like crime, you can vote for him. But most people aren't into that. So I wish him luck. But really, it'd be better off if you got back to New York City and did your job for the little time you have left. Good luck. Do well. You know, sooner or later, <laughs> I'd agree with him on something. No, I totally, I, I agree with him on like, like 80% of what he said there. But wait, was that a leaf blower? What was the thing? He's on Air Force One. Oh, my God. But that was a different sound than the usual. Like, on the plane. Oh, he's on the plane. Yeah, he's you know, on it now. That sounded like a leaf blower. And it, <laughs> usually, it's a vacuum cleaner. You know what I mean? Uh, I wish him luck. 
but really it'd be better off if you got back to New York City and did your job for the little time you <laughs> First okay. of all, the most disingenuous thing he just said was, I wish him luck. You don't wish him luck. You couldn't care less about the Blasio. And by the way, I don't know who's more unpopular in New York City, de Blasio or Trump. Trump is hated in New York City, even though he was born and raised in New York City, even though he made his fortune in New York City. And by the way, is de Blasio the worst mayor New York has ever had? Hmm, that's a tough one. I don't follow New York politics as obsessively as I follow Chicago politics, but I know a thing or two about New York City, okay, D? And uh, I would have to say de Blasio is not even on the list of five worst mayors of New Actually, I have to say that New York's mayors are not as bad as Chicago's. I'm going to just say that, folks. I know you're all supposed to be, oh, I love Chicago more than New York. And it's true, I cannot stand the New York Knicks basketball team. Uh, or the New York Jets and the Giants. But I think their mayors overall have been better than Chicago mayors. Going on a minute. I didn't really like Giuliani, to put it mildly. Uh, but Bloomberg wasn't bad. He's better than Rahm. Uh, though they were kind of cut from the same cloth. Um, I have to think about this a little bit. But de Blasio is definitely not the worst mayor New York City's ever had. And uh, the fact that Trump hates him is probably a reason to vote for him. But I agree with Trump. I don't think um, I don't think De Blasio will be in the race for for long. All right. In other news, nationally, these damned abortion bills. Mm. After Alabama's Republican governor signed, quite frankly, the most extreme abortion legislation I've seen in my lifetime this week, making performing an abortion a felony in nearly all cases. Pro-choice groups are heading to the courts uh, to challenge the anti-abortion laws and bills spreading across this country. By the way, this news coming from Missouri. Missouri's Republican-led House is expected to pass a sweeping bill to ban abortions at eight weeks of pregnancy on lawmakers' final day in session today. Next week, the Center for uh, Reproductive Rights will challenge four laws in a federal court in Virginia. The suit challenges physician-only laws, which require only physicians provide abortions. Nurse practitioners and physician's assistants could also provide these procedures, the group argues. Hospital requirements for second-term abortions, despite being medically unnecessary, and 24-hour waiting periods, which would require a woman to see a physician and then wait 24 hours to obtain an abortion. These laws that the uh, Republican Party is passing are utterly insane. The Republican Party has lost its collective mind. Uh, it, the biggest hypocrite in the world is Donald John Trump. For years and years and years, uh, he was a proponent of a woman's right to choose. The man never cared one whit about the issue of abortion uh, until he realized that he had to sign on to the most extreme anti-abortion views of the biggest wackos in the country. And that's what he's doing now uh, in order to secure that evangelical vote, which is enough to lock up about, I don't know, 25 states, get to get David Ferris in here uh, to go through the electoral map. Uh, but um, it's the law in particular in Alabama, which would punish women more, uh, excuse me, punish doctors more than rapists. Uh, if doctors who perform, let's say a woman is raped and is, get, is impregnated, doctor performs an abortion, the law would punish the doctor more than the rapist is absolutely insane. You've lost your mind, Republicans. And um, there's just no center at all in the Republican Party. It's a disgrace. We're going to have a couple of Republicans come on this show uh, next week. The who were old time Republicans are going to talk about how their party has just lost its freaking mind. Marcy Love will be here, D, D. Bobby, and I'm really looking forward to that conversation. But when I see how far and how extreme the Republican Party is, how filled with hate it is for women, it's disgusting. And I'm looking anywhere for any Republican who will have the guts to stand up to this. Uh, it's an like awful political machine that has taken control of the party. I don't see many of them, Dave. All right. And finally, leave it to Massachusetts Senator and Democratic presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren. She has brought out a plan for how to protect abortion rights, and that plan is to legislate it. Warren stated that the extremists behind proposals like the Alabama law do not reflect public opinion in America. Polling data shows that 71 percent of Americans oppose overturning Roe, including 52 percent of Republicans. Here are the bullet points on Warren's plan. One, Congress must pass a law providing for a right to abortion. Two, stop states from passing medically unnecessary abortion restrictions. Three, reproductive health coverage is health coverage. And four, crack down on violence against abortion providers and end the gag rule. The so-called gag rule prevents agencies with... Uh, which accept international U.S. aid from discussing abortion as an option for pregnant women abroad. Oh, my God. There's, I, I agree with her, Bill, but the gag rule, 
gag me with a spoon on the gag rule. The gag rule is Republicans always talk about liberty and free speech when they want to insult someone or de- degradate somebody. But when it comes to free speech from a doctor to talk to a patient, suddenly that person doesn't get free speech. That person, the doctor, has to read a script written by wackos in the Republican Party. Republicans are such frauds. I would have more respect for them if they actually held to the principles they that they, they, they adhere. But no, they're very selective about when they're going to advocate for free speech, when they're going to advocate for liberty, when they're going to advocate for free markets, usually when it benefits them. But when it when it's uh, to the detriment of somebody else, they couldn't care less. So uh, listen, this is coming down. This will be a, a huge issue, I believe, in the 2020 election. The problem, David Ferris, again, we had a conversation with him at Lair this Sunday, I believe. David Ferris, the uh, Roosevelt University political scientist, um, who is really on on target, I think, and on so many of the issues of the day in terms of what the overall strategy of the Democratic Party should be. But as he points out, we have a gerrymandered political system. It's called the Electoral College, folks. So that gives the Republicans freedom to be lunatics and still guarantee, I don't know, I forget how many electoral votes. Uh, it'll come down, the, the election will come down to certain swing states. I've got to believe, I've got to believe that this country has more sense than to um, not just reelect Donald Trump, but to to uh, approve of these draconian, extremist, anti-abortion, anti-woman, uh, anti-woman legislation that's popping up all over the country. Now, of course, we will keep you posted on these stories as today's program rolls along. But coming up after this little break, we're moving on. We're going to talk about what's going on locally. We're going to find out what else is new. So stick around. Read the Chicago Reader to get up to speed on what's what in Chicago. Culture, food, arts and entertainment, weekly concert listings, weekly event listings, the environment, travel. I can continue, but you get the point. And for all of you Chicago political junkies, raw weekly columns on real city politics from Maya Dukmasova and our very own Ben Jarofsky. The Chicago Reader, free to the public in newsstands throughout the city and online at chicagoreader.com. Read it now and be a more informed Chicagoan. Today's Ben Jarofsky Show was brought to you in part by Chicago Architecture Center. Discover the breadth and majesty of Chicago's architecture on a Chicago Architecture Center bus tour. From bungalows to Bauhaus, our expert docents will share the fascinating stories behind our city's architecture. Book your tour at architecture.org slash tours. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm actually on a bus tour right now. Oh my, look at that wonderful piece of architecture. Cirque du Soleil's Big Top comes back to Chicago with its latest show, Volta. Venture into a captivating voyage of discovery inspired by the adventurous spirit of freedom where a surge of action sparks a high-voltage journey. Volta. Playing May 18th through July 6th under the Big Top at Soldier Field. Tickets at CirqueDuSoleil.com. Volta thanks their partners Hennessy Black and Champagne Nicola Fayette. All right, commercial break over. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show, live from the Chicago Sun-Times. Yes, indeed, we are live. And uh, that person you see there just settling in is our new uh, office editor, Miles, is on an airplane taking him to Europe. Leah is uh, sitting in for him. I guess she'll be sitting in replacing him, uh, be here with us uh, for three months, two months. I've lost track. Two-ish. 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 Yeah. Uh, she is a journalism student. She's a resident of the city of Chicago, and she plays the violin. And we're going to be twisting her arm, bring, bring that violin <laughs> here, play the violin, uh, in addition to all, doing all the duties and obligations uh, that working at the Ben Jarofsky uh, entail. And there's a lot of them, right, D? Oh, yeah. I'm a real slave driver. Okay. <laughs> We want her coming back. Oh, uh, yeah. Anyway, welcome to the show, and thanks Thank for coming. Thank you so much. All right, D, what you got for me, boy? All right, we're about to find out what's going on locally, but actually, before we do that, Grumpy Cat died. Uh, you know Grumpy Cat, famous uh, meme cat online? Grumpy Cat? I, oh, you're clueless. <laughs> I've told you I was old. Okay. Uh, but I know about different. Petticoat Junction. All right. Bonanza. Grumpy Cat from, you know, on... On social media? Yeah, did you know about back? Grumpy? I do, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a tragedy. <laughs> I know, Grumpy Cat died. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. 
Ben Jarofsky, not a fan. All right, well, let's <laughs> Didn't find even out. know about Grumpy Cat. <laughs> All right, we're going to find out what's going on locally. It's time for What Else is News. First up, we have a Pritzker Fair tax update. The uh -oh. following comes from quite possibly the meanest Illinois political bulldog in the yard. Capital Facts is Rich Miller. Seriously, go check Capital Facts out if you've yet to. Fantastic source for Illinois politics. Capital F-A-X, like a fax machine. All right. Mm -hmm. With only two weeks remaining in the 2019 regular session, Democrats in the Illinois House say that they are close to securing the 71 votes needed to pass one of Governor J.B. Pritzker's top priorities, a constitutional amendment to overhaul the state's income tax system. They say they're confident that they're going to get that 71? Saying they're pretty confident. Well, you know, Madigan's playing that one close to this. Mike Madigan's the House Speaker, ladies and gentlemen. He's the one who uh, really keeps a close tab uh, on his Democratic caucus. To get this uh, fair tax proposal on the ballot so that you, the voters, get to vote for it, they need 71 votes, a supermajority uh, in the House. They already got it approved by the Senate. No Republican, <laughs> speaking about the lunacy of the Republican Party, no Republicans are in favor. There's not a Republican in the state of Illinois, probably not a Republican in the country, who believes in progressive taxation. They're pretty much subscribed to the notion of regressive taxation. If you learn anything from listening to this show, you know the difference between progressive tax and a regressive tax. A progressive tax is the, a tax that taxes people at a higher rate if they make more money. It's like fundamentally... Uh, the smart thing to do. A regressive tax tax everybody the same so that effectively the poorer you are, the more of your income you're dedicating to government. Effectively, we're running government by tapping, tapping, taxing the people who can least afford to pay it. Makes no sense. By the way, it's a policy that Mayor Rahm has followed for the last four years here in the city of Chicago, which is why we are funding government to a degree by heavily ticketing motorists having red light cameras and then impounding their cars that's a really a constructive way to finance government anyway they need 71 votes in the house and that means they got to round up 71 democrats my bet d is that uh, governor pritzker's on the phone right now hey <laughs> great impression of pritzker <laughs> getting really good at it what's your impression of <laughs> 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 I love it. Just annoyed. Though. Ah. Uh, he's on the phone going, ah, I am not a perfect person. Vote for this bill and, you know, I'll help you with your campaign financing if you need it. Anyway. Here's Illinois State Rep, friend of the Ben Jarofsky show and one hell of a guitar player if you ask me, all right? Robert Martwick. Here's the quote from Martwick. Quote. <laughs> I think we are rapidly closing in on 71, and I'm confident the governor will, with the personal meetings he's having with members, get us over the hump. Yeah, you know what he's doing? He's telling those state reps, look, I know they're going to air all kinds of commercials blasting you, you know, saying you're a tax and spend liberal, but I'll donate money to you to fend off those campaigns. I'll bet you that's the kind of conversation that's going on. Maybe not. I've never been in the closed door, D. I just can only imagine what they say. <laughs> but I am not a perfect person. Huh. <laughs> All right, now when it comes to that other bill Pritzker's looking to get passed, the Recreational Cannabis Legalization Bill. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, another one of our Illinois friends of the conservative persuasion. Oh, no. What yelling to anyone that will listen about oh. how bad this idea is. More uh, on that in a moment. More okay. on that in a moment. All but right. first, Ben, yeah. let's play a quick round of big deal or no big deal. Oh. I'll lay out the story, and okay. you simply tell us if it's a big deal or not, and, of course, why. Because, you know, we're doing a podcast. All right. All right. So <clears> this, all comes right, from, this comes from... Have we ever played this game before? Yes. Okay. <laughs> The memory on this guy. Good Lord. Look at the brain on Brad. Oh, have we done this before? <laughs> All right. This comes from NBC5 okay. Chicago. Mm -hmm. From April 1st, 2018 through March 31st, 2019, uh -huh. friends of our Democratic Illinois Speaker Michael J. Madigan, the Speaker's political committee, made five purchases of Cubs tickets totaling $184,392. Hold on. Let me write this down. Okay. 184. How much? 184. Three nine two four Cubs. Yes, got it. Go no, ahead. Sorry, sorry. According to state campaign finance records, mm -hmm. during the same period, records show Madigan's political campaign spent over one hundred eighteen thousand seven hundred dollars. Got that? Uh, one one eight seven hundred. Uh huh. Go. Combined for White Sox tickets right. and Bulls tickets. They didn't ask you, Ben, to go to any of these. Man, I want, no one ever invites me to anything. <laughs> <laughs> that puts his grand total spent on reports on. tickets according to expenditures filed with the Illinois Board elections at. Uh, hold on, Daniel Biss moment. <laughs> Get him, Biss. Come on. <laughs> How much? 
Oh, you're going to say it? <laughs> Wait, hold on. I got to do two, nine, ten, five, stuff down. 13, nine, ten. Please hurry up. 303,092 dollars. $303,125. Oh, <laughs> that's, I couldn't read my own writing. <laughs> Dan Biss is listening right now. A tear just went down his eye. Dan Biscourse, former Democratic candidate uh, for governor, his claim to fame that it is he's a mathematician. And he can juggle. <laughs> he can juggle? Yeah. Oh, I did not know. I, did I know that? <laughs> <laughs> what is this show today? A spokesman for Madigan said the tickets are used for supporters and volunteers and that if the speaker or his family uses them, they pay for them. A Cullerton political aide added that most tickets are given to charitable Wait, groups. Wait, time out. Cullerton? Yeah, Cullerton political aide. I thought it was Madigan. And it says Cullerton here. Oh, <laughs> I thought it was Madigan. Yeah. Whatever. Then they added that most tickets are given to charitable groups and used less for political purposes. Here's the quote. Quote, it's perfectly legal, but I would also say it's borderline. It's right on the fringe. Former state senator Susan Garrett. Oh, this is uh, Susan Garrett here. Now the chair and co-founder of the Center for Illinois Politics. She said, if you look at other states, mm -hmm. and we have looked, we yeah. don't see any other states that allow for this type of practice. It's it's not how our government should work, but it is in fact how uh, it is in fact how our government works. Jay Young, executive director of Common Cause Illinois, added. Mm. So Ben Jarofsky, spending all that campaign money on sports tickets, big deal or no big deal? Um, at the risk of getting myself kicked out of every single good government group in Chicago, which have already kicked me out because I don't think all their prerogative is a big deal. Oh, yeah. They like won't let me into like rooms anymore. You can't come here until you say all their prerogative is horrible. Uh, at the risk of getting further offending my good government friend. No, I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, I will say this. There's some interesting revelations there. I took the deep dive. Okay. okay. Right, number one. Uh, he spent one hundred eighty-four thousand uh, rough uh, dollars on Cubs tickets alone, but only one hundred eighteen thousand on Sox and Bulls tickets together. What? No love for the Sox and the Bulls, Madigan? Michael Joseph Madigan? That's a little North Side favorable to. You're a South Side politician. Why are you giving all that money to the Cubs, huh? Why are you giving all that money to the Ricketts family, like huh? Pointing at me. <laughs> So I think right there, um, that's a big deal. He's wasting money on the Cubs. The Cubs don't need the money. The Sox need the money. If you're going to waste money on, go, you know, like trying to woo people to your side by giving tickets, take them to the Sox game. The Cubs don't need, they don't need to sell any tickets. The place is packed every day. So look, the things I find outrageous, right, D? Uh, interesting, no money on Blackhawks. Did you see that? Yeah. No money for the Blackhawks. Mm. Huh, there's no hockey fans out there. I, I okay, see there's bears. <laughs> What about the Bears, Madigan? Come on now. Oh, don't like soccer? Where's the Chicago Fire? <laughs> yeah. So uh, interesting. You know, it's like he's giving all that money to the Cubs. I think it is outrageous. Now I'm totally in agreement with the, the good government people. Boo-hoo. But no, come on. I mean, it's, listen, by the way, it's it, I don't know who gets those tickets. It's like big-time operators. Do they give it to normal human beings like you or me? Did we go? <laughs> Were we there? No, the only time we ever got to go, our good friend David Hochberg every now and then would, uh, hey, Benny, I'll give you a ticket. But, you can't uh, help if you don't call, by the way, David Hochberg. Uh, Hochberg, I know you're hiding ever since I got this new podcast. But anyway, uh, uh, no, I, I, I don't find this particularly outrageous. If they give the tickets away to like people who wouldn't ordinarily get to go to the game. So like ordinary human beings get to go to a baseball game uh, as opposed to the well-connected and the already wealthy and you know, the in crowd that already has tickets. So I, um, if you're doing it right, Michael Joseph Madigan, I don't have a problem with it, but if you're just giving it to the powerful, uh-uh. So Jarofsky's going no big deal. All right, let's talk reefer finally here. Ooh. Capital Facts is Rich Miller really, and we're not smoking. Oh. We're getting all excited. <laughs> and finally uh, here, Capital Facts is Rich Miller really outdid himself today. He featured a story out of the downstate paper, the Taylorville Daily News oh. in Taylorville, Illinois. Ben, have you ever visited Taylorville? No, where is, is uh, it? Was it named for Andy Taylor? Uh, probably not. Do you know who Andy Taylor is? Not a clue. Oh, my God. Speaking of old things, I'll now do Andy Taylor. Boy, you just... It's Andy the... <laughs> we don't want listeners today, guys. Do you know Especially millennials. We don't want young people listening Oh, I know a lot today. of millennials who love Andy and Mayberry. Yeah, that was the Andy Griffin show. Yeah, okay. Isn't, wasn't his name Andy Taylor? No. Oh, He's wow. Sheriff Taylor. 
Right? All right. So let's talk. Where's recently. Frank? Frank, give us some. It was Andy Taylor, wasn't it? Anyway, sorry. Who cares? All right. Now, our host, Ben Jarofsky, has a theory when mm. it comes to downstaters yes. and dope. Ben, what is that theory? That theory is they smoke it, okay? That they smoke marijuana downstate, but politicians, newspaper editorial writers, pretend as though they don't. Oh, my God. I'm shocked. Marijuana in Taylorville. Where is Taylorville, did you say? Uh, it's downstate uh, going down Highway 55. I think it's a little past Springfield, maybe before Springfield if you're heading. Have you ever been there? Uh, no, I have just drove by. Is it in the 618 area? Code? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Not uh, so I, maybe, I don't know, maybe Taylorville's the one community in America where they don't smoke marijuana, but I doubt it. It's right, right near Springfield. Merrill Haggard smoked marijuana. Republicans are right, downstaters. Merrill Haggard wrote the song, Okie from Muskogee, and that song came out in 1969, and ever since then, people have said, oh, they don't smoke marijuana downstate or in rural towns, blah, blah, blah. So and Ben Drosky feels that a lot of downstaters would uh, be for J.D. Absolutely. You, you agree with it, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Coming from downstate. Well, Sheriff Bruce Kettlecamp and the Sheriff's Association, along with the Chiefs of Police, well, they say you're full of it, buddy. <laughs> They're not the first. Yeah, they very, see eye to eye with Rom. They're they're very concerned over the pending legalization of marijuana put forward in the state of Illinois, and Sheriff Kettlecamp is urging citizens to contact Senator Andy Menar mm. and let him know that the proposal for the legislation of marijuana is a very bad idea mm. and that it is creating a public risk and putting at jeopardy the safety of the citizens of Christian County and the state. Sheriff Kettlecamp is also concerned with the homegrown part of the law, which would allow citizens to grow up to five plants in their yard. Kettle Camp, which, by the way, awesome last name, <laughs> says that he's worried about the drug cartel coming in and buying up the houses and selling Wait, on. Wait, what drug cartel? It's going to be legal. you worried about... Oh, sorry, go finish the story. Oh, that's all right. Kettle Camp says he's worried about the drug cartel coming in and buying up the houses and selling on the black market cheaper than at the commercial places. I see. Sheriff Kettle Camp says that <laughs> while Representative... Avery Bourne is against the bill. He doesn't believe Senator Andy Menard is, and he hopes that everyone contacts Senator Menard to tell him to vote against it. Mm. Is he also for uh, prohibition? Does he say that? Like the abolition of free sale of alcohol? No, is he for that? that uh, no. Okay. Hmm. Uh, what about legalized gambling? Is he against that? Uh, doesn't say, doesn't say that. that. I mean, can the cartel buy up all the liquor and sell it for cheaper? Isn't that going to happen? It could happen, right? Hmm. Come on, man. It's like... They they act as though people have not been smoking marijuana in their hometowns forever. I don't get it. You know what? I shouldn't say anything about Taylor. I've never been there. So for all I know, like I said, at maybe the one town in Illinois oh, where no man. one smokes marijuana. They are in Christian County, so I don't know. Yeah. State Senator Andy Menar has responded. He said he thinks there is zero chance of the session going into June, though he is also skeptical about quick passage of recreational marijuana legislation. Such a big change in policy, quote, usually doesn't happen in a matter of months, he said, and he is not yet in the yes column for the change. Uh, who said this? Menar said mm -hmm. this? Not, yeah, he's, he's from uh, 618. Yeah, he is from Here's what he's doing right now. He's looking at that weather vane and seeing which way the wind blows. If you don't need his... Hey, here, let me, let me give you a little legislative advice, Andy, like you need it from me. Hey, if they don't need the vote, and you're going to win anyway, vote no. And then the Taylorville editorial board and Sheriff Andy Taylor or whatever the guy's name is down there will say, good job, Andy. Sheriff Kettle Camp. Oh, Kettle Camp. Okay. <laughs> They went to high school with a kid named Kettle Camp. Oh, we have Frank updates. Frank, you're listening. Thank you so much, as always. Uh, Frank updates here. I'm waiting for my phone to pull him up here. All right, mm -hmm. here we go. Frank here. So <laughs> talking to uh, Andy Taylor. All right, so let's see here. Frank says it's Sheriff Andy Taylor in the Andy Griffith Show. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Like four or five people are <laughs> jumping up and down. Also, is today's show all about old TV show theme song? Apparently so, Frank. <laughs> Apparently so. I was just trying to demonstrate how old I am by uh, doing the Bonanza theme and then, you know, the Andy Griffin. It's harder to whistle than you think, D. You have to drink water before you whistle. Oh, okay. You're not going to whistle. <laughs> uh, there you are. Just like that, you're now in the know of what's going on in Chicago and or Illinois. And now you will have an answer the next time someone asks you, hey, what else is news? Let me tell you something. Something like Grumpy Cat, Cool Cat, and Cat Stevens all agree. Cat Stevens, one of your favorite singers, I know. You did a great job. Well, this Give is not the show for millennials today. <laughs> Give yourself a raise. Take it out of petty cash. Ramon Hussein is here. we got a lot to talk about, and we'll get down to it when we return.
Hey everybody, what you're about to hear are the piano stylings of Jeff Manuel. Man, listen to Jeff go. Jeff Manuel has been playing piano around Chicago for years. He's played for conventions, for celebrities, played in basement bars with blues bands. He's played at prestigious social clubs, fine restaurants, and in the intimacy of private homes. Book Jeff Manuel at jeffemanuelpianist.com. Don't worry, I'll spell his name at the end of this commercial. You know what Chicago Magazine said? They said that Jeff Manuel is, quote, as comfortable with Chopin as he is with Cole Porter. He's excellent and his performance is joyous. He offers an elegant stream of compositions and interpretations that entertains the mind but won't hurt the ears. To hear more of Jeff Manuel's work and to book Jeff for your next event, go to jeffmanuelpianist.com. I'm going to spell it out for you people. J E F F M as in Mary, A, N as in Nancy, U, E, L, P, I, A, N, I, S, T, dot com. Take it away, Jeff Manuel. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show. Take it away, Benny J. All right, we'll do it. Every Friday, Romana Hussein, editor from the Chicago Sun-Times, is so gracious as to stop by and go over the headlines of the week. Uh, pretty much, I, I give her credit for editing every single story in the Sun-Times, and she always tells me, no, Ben, I don't edit every single story in the Sun-Times. Like Sometimes you feel like you edit every single story in the paper. Yeah. Uh, well, That's why I don't read it the next day. All right, because you've already seen it, read it, no, digested it, dissected it, uh, corrected the spelling errors. Um, I, I We have to talk about this one story. It's huge. I know a lot of our listeners are out of town. They may not know about it. One of the most horrific tales, just like small version evil distilled. Uh, and uh, it's the headline story in the Sun-Times. I think it may be the headline story. Yep, it's the headline story in the Tribune as well. A family's horror. I'm reading the headline mother daughter charged with strangling pregnant teen marlon ochoa lopez cutting baby from womb absolutely horrific um romana just sort of give us the updates on this one go a little um these okay so there's you just basically read the headline what happened was um i can tell you what prosecutor said these three individuals who were charged in the murder mm -hmm. the third individual who is the boyfriend of the mom he was charged with concealment of homicide. The other two, I believe, were charged with the murder of this young woman. This young woman was um, about, I think she was close to term, and uh, she ha was on a Facebook group for young mothers. And uh, according to prosecutors, the mother, who's 46 years old, this is the defendant, her name is uh, Clarissa F Figueroa, and her daughter, Desiree, who actually is four months pregnant, that came out in court today. So uh, Clarissa Figueroa was on this Facebook group and hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. She was on this Facebook group and she had exchanged uh, messages with the um, victim. And, you know, they had a, this woman had given this younger woman clothes before baby clothes or baby equipment. Um, and so this young woman was lured to the home, according to prosecutors, a, a home in Scottsdale. Um, Scottsdale's a neighborhood in the city. Of yeah, Chicago. in the city of Chicago, and she was lured over there with the promise of given be given a stroller and some boy baby clothes. But when she gets there, so she's sitting there. This is what came out in court today. She's sitting there on the couch, and she's actually looking at a photo album of the defendant, defendant's son who had died. Mm -hmm. She had a twenty-something year old son. I think it's twenty-five year old son. And so um, the, this mother and daughter team, according to prosecutors, then tr um, you know basically strangled her with the cable, and then the the according to you know the prosecutors, the younger woman her, whose name is Desiree Figueroa, um, she came back with a knife and they cut the baby 
out of the womb. And in, in court, they were saying that the mom at some point was like yelling at the daughter saying she was doing it, wasn't doing it right. Mm. And so I think they had strangled her for about five minutes from oh what God. came out in court. Mm. But, you know, this young, this young woman went to this home you know, thinking she was going to get the stroller and the baby clothes on April 23rd. So it had been a few weeks since her body had been found. And her body was actually found in in a in a garbage can in the backyard mm-hmm. of this home. And the, like I said, the boyfriend was also charged with uh, concealment of homicide. The boyfriend of the older Bobek. Figaro. So, Bobek, I believe his name is. Yeah, yeah. Bobek. Yeah, I mm-hmm. forgot his first name. But um, he was he was in court today, too. And all three were denied bond. Um, you know, there was a lot of family members of this young woman, Mar- uh, Marlon Ochoa Lopez, that were in court today from what I'm told. And it's a very, very sad story. And it echoes a case that happened over 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Deborah yeah. Evans um, in Addison, Illinois, she was also yeah. pregnant. And her ex-boyfriend, with the help of others, had come and killed her and mm-hmm. cut the baby out. And I, I and I believe that um, there was three other kids, and two of the kids were killed. I think one kid was killed the next day after you know he was left in the house with his dead sister and dead mom. And I think he had talked about being scared, and then be, the the defend, defendants in that case were worried about him being a witness, and they came back and yeah. killed him. So this very, I mean, the case is similar in that this a woman was killed and the baby was taken out of her mm-hmm. womb with yeah. them they use the, use the scissors of in the um case There's from some. 95 but it's this one i think it from what i understand i literally just edited that story and we're still updating it um we got a new computer we got a new system this week i don't know if you notice this sometimes there's a new website yes i did that's a whole other story so yeah. uh, <laughs> we have a new system called chorus um uh-huh. and so all the reporters are learning how to do the story so yeah. we're just kind of scrambling uh, learning how to put in stories in the system and you know we're learning too how to edit it in that system and it's actually pretty easy but still i was so scrambling to do that so we're updating the story but they literally were just in court um in violence court at noon these Mm -hmm. three defendants in this case it's just a very horrific um story no it's just unspeakable evil and uh really twisted demented behavior and i guess the question i have i struggle with this myself uh how much attention should any of us give to this it's the, as I said, it's I get two newspapers delivered every day, as you know, or three actually, but two locals, and it's the front page story with the same uh, horrible picture of the grieving father. Oh yeah, and it These just breaks your heart when you see it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, the headline is just brutal. It's in your face. People are talking about it. Uh, I know that this is the kind of thing that gets just thousands and thousands of hits and clicks because it's. It's just something that it lures people into it. Uh, you've been in this business a long time, Romana, well, not as long as I have, but uh, how do you wrestle with this? Like these stories, like it's, how much I weight mean, and attention? I, I think the story is going to get a lot of attention just because of the nature of the case. Unfortunately, we have gotten so used to crime. Um, I remember the days when um, school shootings were a big deal. No, they're not. <laughs> you know, it's it's sad, but... This case is just, I, I think, just given how different it is, it's going to get a lot of, I think it's going to get a lot of traction for a long time. It's something that we're going to be following, I think, closely. Mm-hmm. And I don't think people are, you know, it's not going to be one of those stories that everybody's paying attention to and then suddenly kind of like interest dwindles. I think this one is going to be one of those ones where people are going to be paying attention to because it's not the run of the mill case. Mm-hmm. It's involving a mother. Yeah, I, I I remember the Deborah Evans case. I remember the name Deborah Evans. So for someone, I wasn't really in full time news at that time. Yeah, you're not that old. I am old, but <laughs> you're not I, that I, old. I, you're I, way younger than me. I was me. out of college by that point, okay. looking for a job. But I do remember that case. I remember the woman's face. I remember the picture that they kept using. So I think this is it. This hasn't happened in years, and it is kind of strange that it happened again after you know twenty something years. And you know the allegations. I mean, I don't. You know, this woman who's who the 46 year old woman who was the, you know, quote unquote leader or ringleader, alleged ringleader of this case. um, She was telling everybody she was pregnant. And uh, the day that this woman with young woman was killed, she was seen on her porch cradling the baby and her hands, you know, were all full of blood. Her shorts weren't, but her hand was. And she said the baby just kind of popped out. 
and she was telling everybody that she was pregnant and then you know even on the facebook group you know she says she was pregnant but then she said her tubes were tied and she was kind of going back and forth with her story she had pictures of a nursery set up um i was looking at some of the the exchanges the two women or the victim and the suspect mm-hmm. had before so there, it's a very it's a very sad was, and gruesome case there's some uh part of the stories uh, in both papers uh deals with criticism uh about the investigation yes and uh I, what's your thoughts of that i i think there's some good questions that people have um i i know the parents had um questions they said that the young woman's car was out right outside yeah. or maybe like a block away mm-hmm. from the scottsdale home where she was killed mm-hmm. um they said that you know there's the police kept issuing it tickets not realizing that this is the car of the missing woman who had been missing for three weeks so um you know there's going to be criticism i think some of the criticism probably is warranted well, this case isn't going to go away. No, I'm this telling case you that. Is not yeah, it's go definitely away. something that you know people are interested in, not just here, but I think across the country. Yeah, uh, and uh, let's. It's a sort of a nat- national natural transition to the next story, uh, which of course uh, people love. Romana's updates on uh, Jesse Smollett. <laughs> Some uh, people, and uh, <laughs> you know, you'd be surprised how many people love the Jesse Smollett story on so many levels uh, because. It's it's crime, but it's not as just it's not as horrific as evil as this thing, you know. Yeah, and, it's kind of like the Joel Moreno case, I guess. Oh my god, well, that let's write that <laughs> one down and talk about <laughs> that, that one. It's the crime one, beat with uh, that was also <laughs> filing a false police report. Yes, oh alleged, my god. So uh, one more time, for our new listeners may not know this. Our our re- veterans know this. Romana uh, covered criminal courthouse for many years, so she knows this beat very well. Now she edits everything in the paper. Not everything, but it seems like everything in the newspaper. Um, and uh, so, all right, let's, uh, Jesse Smollett, the, the uh, tremendous amount of investigatory uh, power that was thrown at his claim that he was mugged, um, and as opposed to the fact that it took, um, I forget how long to, three weeks to figure out you know a couple weeks a couple yeah weeks. before well, he pro- was charged no, I'm talking before about they Ap- believe that he was uh, i'm talking about the uh the murder uh, story that april 23rd the one was missing oh right? the April. Yeah, okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're talking about yeah. small yeah, yeah 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 but i'm saying so there's a just a na- that's a natural contrast that a lot of people yeah. are talking about um all right jesse smollett what is the latest uh on this one there's there's been some you know there were just some jesse smollett news this week but it was very minor so earlier this week i want to say about maybe two days ago so the judge who got the case his name was judge stephen watkins and he was a judge where where the prosecutors went before and said we're going to drop these charges so anyway this week earlier he set a date for next week i believe it's may 23rd when where he's going to rule on whether jesse smollett's um records will be unsealed or kept sealed so I don't know if you remember or if the readers remember that when the charges were dropped, there were 16 counts of disorderly conduct um, charges that were dropped. Uh, Jesse Smollett's case file was sealed mm-hmm. after that. Um, uh, our reporter in his story, um, like earlier this week, Andy Grimm, who covers criminal courts now, he had mentioned that there probably isn't much in those files, but he's saying that the fact that that's filed uh, or that's sealed, those cases, the, that case file sealed, a, a police are kind of citing that as reasons not to give more information or, you know, give record their records. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like, so the media, there the media has a lawyer basically arguing why the files should be unsealed, and obviously Jesse Smollett's lawyers are saying that they should remain sealed. Yeah, and it's an interesting argument. I read about this argument that uh, Jesse, Jesse Smollett's lawyers are making. It's there's like, this man has suffered enough. And if we unseal, I'm like trying not to laugh. That's what I'm saying. It's so absurd. Yeah. What has he suffered? You know. I know. I mean, I don't know. A couple he got weeks away ago, he this. bought a new house, so he was like moving or like or his. He was like okay. there was something on TMZ. It was very tangential. I mean, I don't know if you heard, but Empire is not being renewed. I did. And, even I'm aware of that. And yeah. so uh, that's not being renewed. So he might get another job somewhere. Who knows? But we know that his character was not supposed to come back, but they kind of left it open. But this kind of, you know, it might be moved. Yeah. It might, I mean, he might come for a final appearance. Or, but there was something else that happened today. So there was the um, 
retired appellate court judge, Sheila O'Brien, yeah. she had asked for a special prosecutor to look into how Kim Fox, mm-hmm. who was the Cook County State's Attorney, handled the Jesse Smollett case. So you, as you know, the Cook County Inspector General, Patrick Blanchard, is already looking into this as a special special investigator. And so Sheila O'Brien is also asking for a special prosecutor looking into this matter, but this is on the 26 and Cal side or at the courthouse side. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't know, last week, um, Judge uh, Leroy, he's a chief criminal courts judge recused. He said he didn't recuse himself. He said he's passing on the matter to Judge Michael Tooman, who's Mm -hmm. handled a lot of special prosecutor cases. So anyway, she's asking for another judge. She's saying that there should be another judge that should look into this. It should be a judge outside of Cook County. So she was arguing about so that Martin today. So Martin Tuman's not even good enough. Well, that's what she was saying, Michael yeah. Tuman. Yeah, oh, she Michael, was, she was, she's mm-hmm. like, I think it needs to be kicked over because everybody's like affiliated with Kim Fox. I think that's her argument. And just so today he kind of like... Uh, I don't know, gave her a tongue lashing who, kind of. Who, this Tuman is Judge, or, Sorry, this is Judge Tuman. Just basically rejecting everything she said. He also kind of quashed some subpoenas that she had out for Kim Fox and Jesse Smollett and other people based on technicalities. So he just said, you know, he rejected all this, all the requests that this um, Stichilla O'Brien had. And then he had a, I think he set a May 31st date for uh, arguments mm-hmm. about whether or not a special prosecutor should be appointed for this and, case. Uh, it, I don't know if we've ever discussed this one in particular, but uh, Sheila O'Brien uh, does not literally have standing in this matter. She's asserted standing. She's a retired. Yes, she's a retired appellate court justice. Yeah, and and I did not know this so much about the law. I did not. I do not know. I learn on a regular basis by reading the Sun Times uh, and Andy Grimm. But uh, apparently, anybody can just file documents in court asking to. Uh, weigh in on a case did i didn't did you i mean obviously I, you knew I, that but I, I don't know. know i i, I guess the people can but I, you don't see it it's not very common so you know she's somebody that's a lawyer so i guess people would take that more seriously than if i s- <laughs> submitted something i would think <laughs> yeah. I, that's what i would think i would I don't, I don't know i would think that a lot of judges at 26 and cal wouldn't take me seriously if i filed something but you can i mean there's a lot of reporters who file things too right so in a different yeah, ways, I, FOIAs, but you can probably file something. Yeah, but the public can. It's I did not know this that a, a ordinary citizen could um, stir up so much what uh, action on the yeah. part of our criminal justice system. I mean, they're taking I would, very I would seriously. Think if a, I would think that if average Joe did that, they would get a lawyer to help them. Yeah, that's what I would think. Uh, yeah, or average Joe did that would probably laugh him around. Yeah, but exactly. She's a retired uh, judge. I got to get her on the show to see what what is motivating her to do this. Uh, just of all the things in the world to go to court over. She, you know, I don't think she, she doesn't really speak to, I don't know if she spoke to reporters last time in court, but she really, um, she'll talk to us, but I don't know if she's ever wanted to be quoted. She'll like give us her documents that she's filed. I see. You know. Uh, so it's almost a mysterious figure. But there. you can definitely try. She, you never know. She might want yeah, to Yeah, maybe. Um, and mm-hmm. there was another thing that happened. Well, this wasn't, this just didn't necessarily have to do with the Jesse Smollett case, but it was kind of connected in a way. It was that case in Rolling Meadows. Oh, yeah. Where this mm-hmm. young woman, Candace Clark, she also got charged with disorderly conduct. And the judge thought that the deal that the prosecutors were offering was not, was kind of uneven and yeah. he mentioned the Jesse Smollett case and said well she's not a celebrity so I guess she's going to be treated differently and because he talked about it and we reported it there's a defense attorney named William Conway who showed up in court this week and said I'm going to represent you for free whoa okay so that's she, all it so, takes is so, one article yeah, the time. yeah so so <laughs> she got she got a lawyer for, over over this I think I, I think I could be wrong but she might have had an assistant public defender before but that that's like a Smollett um, offshoot, related yeah. offshoot in the suburbs <laughs> no, case, but there's always something small related. It's like the story it, just continues. And this story will we will be talking about this forever. Okay, yeah. I mean, uh, Jesse Smollett. It, it there's so many issues uh, at stake here, political issues, etc. So people are outraged, raged, and playing it uh, every which way they can. I have to tell you this, uh, folks. Uh, if, not today, but check out. Uh, our interview with Ricky Hendon, state senator, Ricky Hendon, former state senator, Ricky Hendon, political uh, uh, operative. We, he was on the show last week, Ramana, and he has some very interesting observations, to put it mildly, about what 
interest in most on Jesse Smollett. I'll leave it at that. No, oh, okay. Now I'm curious. Yeah, now, no, I'll, now I'll have to listen. <laughs> you have to listen. Well, you should listen anyway because he's hilarious. <laughs> Ricky Hennon knows a lot about Chicago politics. All right, moving on to a good column today by Neil Stummer. I'm going to give you credit for editing it, even if you didn't edit it. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's a good column. It brings back a name that uh, probably many Chicagoans have forgotten if they ever knew at all. But you obviously have heard this name. Uh, I know this name because I'm a big follower of the Chicago Sun-Times, Conrad Black. Yeah. Uh, and he was pardoned by Donald John Trump. What a shrewd move by Conrad Black. He wrote a puff piece about Donald Trump. He wrote uh, a book, right? Yeah, a book. Donald Trump, a president like no other. Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, puff piece book. Yeah, I was uh, going to say. Yeah. and <laughs> um, Of course, he's not a president like any other. I was... Uh, but, yeah, and so Trump liked the book, or at least he liked the title. So I'm, I doubt he read the book. Um, he actually, in his pardon, he mentioned the two other books that Conrad Black had written about presidents, but he yeah, didn't mention this book. He didn't mention this, but isn't that funny uh, oversight? Uh, anyway, so he he pardoned him, and uh, uh, Neil Steinberg really took everybody to task in this column, really good column by Neil Steinberg, uh, talking about Conrad Black's legacy at the Sun-Times. Were, were you here for Conrad Black? I, I was, I was. I don't remember him. I do remember David Radler. I think he was, David Radler was a publisher at mm -hmm. the time. I remember him coming into the office and he might have, I used to work for Michael Sneed. I was her assistant. I remember him coming into the office and talking and I just remember reading some stuff about Conrad Black and he was just like, I don't know, his, I could say, I don't know, I just, he kind of rubbed me the wrong way from what I, this is before he was actually charged. But he was charged, now he went he to- He was charged with fraud and obstruction of justice and he got six and a half years in federal prison, but I think he only served three years. Mm -hmm. And this was, he got sentenced in 2007, but he basically like looted the company defrauded the investors like i think it was called hollinger international mm -hmm. and um i remember at the time i mean roger ebert wrote about it as well and we were just really angry and i i feel like af it was like probably a year after he was charged with fraud i mean he was convicted we started having layoffs and i don't know if the sun times fully recovered since then um i mean we were always known compared to the Tribune as having the smaller staff, but mm. we had a lot more people here. I mean, the papers suffered. We lost a lot of valuable talent. And I just feel like it started in that year, 2008. I just remember ever since then, it's just been bad. So I think everybody, just, everybody that worked for the Sun-Times, or I think a lot of reporters in this town, they just hear Conrad Black and just kind of Wretch. cringe. Yeah. yeah, and the fact that he was pardoned over this is just, I mean, and, and one it's other, a shame. One I, other, I have no problem saying that. So. There's one other aspect of the story uh, that Neil alludes to. Let me. Uh, here we go. Um, this is Neil Steinberg writing in today's uh, Sun Times. Good column by Neil Steinberg. I urge everyone to read it. I never met Black myself. This is Neil writing, and only saw him once after slipping into the back of U.S. District Judge Amy St. Eve's courtroom. I have nothing against him personally, even though he did bankrupt us and sell our building to Trump and his developers <laughs> so that his shameful name could stand in letters 20 feet tall in the heart of our liberal city. Well done, Neil Steinberg. Yeah, I read that. I remember reading that too. That uh, and uh, yeah, so I forget, that's another little element to the story. People, It's really never been explored uh, in great detail how it was that Donald Trump secured the land. The the Sun Times, my beloved bright one, for years was in a. Did you ever work at that building? Yeah, I, I started working at the Sun Times in two thousand and one. So I I wasn't there for that long because we moved in two thousand and four to the River North location, and of yeah. course now we're in the West Loop. So we have moved twice since I started working at the Sun Times. Well, for years, but it was that on the banks building, of the river. that mm -hmm. building. Okay, I admit I thought that building was really ugly. I I just thought it wasn't very as i don't know aesthetically I didn't pleasing think it was that good but but it was a building that i had seen since i was a kid yeah. and it's always in the movies and you know i i i still liked it in yeah. that way that it was all i think it was supposed to resemble a barge that's what it did resemble what, a barge <laughs> that's what it was supposed to resemble uh, but it was still the sun times building and it was still our building so even before donald trump was elected and started saying um things against a lot of individuals that I like and groups that I belong to. Um, you know, I remember saying that I was never gonna step foot in that building because they 
you know, they, he ripped down the Sun Times. They ripped and, out, desecrated the site. And then, so I was like, I, I, I have never walked. I've walked past it, but I've never been inside. Well, let me ask you a question, uh, in your opinion as an architectural critic. Uh, what is uglier? <laughs> The uh, the old the Chicago the Sun Times building or the Trump sign that is now? Um, <laughs> Come on, Ramon. I'll be honest. I, I I think the Trump sign is uglier. Absolutely agree I, with you one hundred percent. But I I do remember Trump tweeting. This is before he became known as the tweet. Before he anybody knew he was going to run for president. This is a couple of years. I think twenty twelve or. Mm. 2013 he tweeted about how ugly the building was and i think blair came in like like responded blair came in as the architect the critic, critic for, for the, the tribune. tribune yeah but i remember there was some sort of like back and forth like some sort of twitter war Wait, but uh, this is like before before he was even announcing that he was president he was talking about how he changed the skyline or made chicago's like you know look so much better yeah. and i remember everybody was so offended like even every reporter in town was like just disgusted well there's so much to be offended on about that that's an ugly chapter in chicago politics in my humble opinion romana shows um just uh, how easily we are to be manipulated in the city of chicago right now donald trump is probably the most disliked political figure in the city of Chicago. More disliked than Rahm Emanuel. More disliked than Bruce Rauner. Uh, more disliked than any other politician in the uh, in the country. I would say. I would. I, I, would I don't think. know if there's a poll in the world, but I, I would wouldn't guess, be surprised. I would yeah. guess that he's number one, and yet his name is emblazoned on that building in the one of the most prominent locations right on the Chicago River. Uh, Dennis and I, were ever on that brown line going home, we see that <laughs> yeah. sign all the time, every day. It's his way of giving us the finger, and he got the city of Chicago. He manipulated the powers that be. He hired Ed Burke as his property tax lawyer. He got he gave $50,000 to Mayor Rahm's campaign contribution. Suddenly, there was no oversight at all. They allowed the city, somehow or other, mysteriously, allowed him to have that name there, and then said, there's nothing we can do. Isn't that interesting? There's it is. Nothing? It's, it's very interesting. R. Kelly lives there now. I no. Believe. Yeah, I believe he lives in the Trump Tower. Are you sure about yeah, that? Yeah. R. Kelly's got enough money to live in the. <laughs> I thought he was hard up. Well, he can't pay his bail. I mean, when we were covering, we we're covering, um, you know, when while we we're covering this case, I think, I believe he's at Trump Tower because we've had people sitting outside the Trump Tower whenever there's. Maybe they're in the wrong getting, place. I, no I, wonder I, we can't thought, find them. I thought, was, <laughs> I thought that was very interesting. I'm like, People uh, live there, so I don't know. I find it interesting. I, even though you're saying people don't like him, there are people who are living inside that building. Oh, no, a lot of people live inside <laughs> that. I, can't, so I will not argue like, that point. Uh, I mean, I don't know if oh, I, I don't know, even if I could afford it, I don't know if I would buy a building. Although, I don't know if you saw this story. I talked about it yesterday briefly. There was a story somewhere where, follow me on this one. This is just Donald Trump, well, I can't say at his worst, but pretty bad. Um, complaining about the lack of the, there's vacancies in trump uh tower and they the trump organization oh, they said because of the chicago crime. crime yeah i'm like are you kidding me now you're gonna just trash us some more but no i mean i think i i, I did meet i i have met someone who is a friend of uh, my sister-in-law who worked for like not at the trump towers like as a hospitality person but i think they would lose business if they would when she i think she moved she like came went to another job but she might have mentioned to people like i think that she was working like she just mentioned trump and it would definitely not hold well with a lot of people oh, so yeah. i could imagine just working at trump towers and just getting negative response well, but i don't know i would think that a lot of people Maybe even if they were Trump supporters, I think in this town, like, would you, what if you had friends that didn't like Trump? Would they come over to your house? Uh, no, well, this is an argument I've made. I've actually advanced this argument, and I'll advance it one more time. Fritz Kagey, Cook County Assessor, if you're listening. Um, I maintain, Donald Trump's lawyers, uh, starting with Ed Burke, have been, uh, go, to, go to the assessor's office all the time to get their property uh, uh, taxes re reduced uh, on the grounds that they can't uh, rent all the commercial or retail uh, space in the in the building they say well it's for various reasons they can't uh, rent all the space and therefore it's not as valuable and they shouldn't have as much of an as high as an assessment they should get a break in the taxes and uh, the cook county assessor has fallen for this 
malarkey year after year. And my contention is, well, the reason why, one of the reasons why you can't rent it is because you get that ugly name that people hate on the building. So you cannot, you cannot come to the taxpayers and ask them for relief uh, if True. you're not willing to take that name off your building. And um, I was hoping that Lori Lightfoot would. Uh, yeah, what it. would you have to do to take it off? I, I was just wondering what steps you'd have to take. Could you just send someone over and take it off? <laughs> kind of like Meg's Field? Yes, no. why not? Yes. See in court, Donnie. Yeah. yeah I, where's Mayor Daly yeah. when you need him? <laughs> just go in the middle of the night, yeah. rip it down. That's what I was. I don't know. That's a possibility, I guess. All right. I got to let you get back to uh, editing your stories. But before I let you go, I need an update, a Romana update. Are you still uh, loyal to the... You haven't, I haven't asked you the Cub to Ricketts the Cubs. questions. Uh, they, they're one I, abomination I, after another with the Cubs. I know. What's next? Uh, what's, um, uh, you're a loyal Cub fan. You're I, season ticket holder. I, I still cheer for the team, but I don't know. It's, it's a little hard every day, but I still like them. I still like the team. All right, she's sticking loyal <laughs> to that. Team. Well, I mean, I'm I'm not never gonna. Che- I mean, not, I don't. I'm not gonna say I'm never gonna cheer for the Sox, but I'll always take the Cubs over the Sox. I only cheer for the Sox when they make it close to the World Series and the playoffs. Or well, something. we I I love love them both. We had this story we did earlier. Michael Madigan's um, campaign fund has uh, do- bought all these tickets from the Sox, the Cubs, and the Bulls, and then donate them. Uh, to I don't give them out to whoever you know uh, maybe they gave them to Maya my next guest I don't know we'll ask her <laughs> she, <laughs> she says no uh, but I, uh, I mean I I'm just t- letting you know I I was born in Chicago and I was raised in the northern burbs but yeah. that was the one team that I always cheered for since I was 14 15 I don't I like all their Chicago teams but I never liked them as much as I like the Cubs right. so that's why it's it's hard, but I, I, I know I know if people don't want to support the Cubs because of all this Ricket stuff. Ricket stuff, I can understand. Or the white supremacists who yes. gave the white supremacist side. Well to, that was a fan. That was a fan. Okay. But yeah. then Ricketts, I mean Yeah, it I don't know what's the difference between that fan. I know, and the, I know. Uh, Rick and, Morrissey's column was really good. Yeah, Rick Morrissey's so. column was excellent on that subject. Rick, I know uh Rick, Many of my political followers don't realize there's a sports section of the Chicago Sun-Times. And, uh, it was Rick a very Morrison's. good column. He said, I guess this guy's a nice man, just like Joe Ricketts. That's a dance yeah. name. Yeah, just like Joe just Ricketts. Just like Joe Ricketts. Yeah. The, so. the, the, now, uh, but I was going to say, Madigan uh, gave, uh, bought $184,000 worth of Cubs tickets, but only $118,000 worth of Sox and Bulls tickets together. So Madigan, a Southside politician, it's got that cub fever. Well, when I went, to, I can just before right before I leave, I'll let you know. When I w- I was in Cincinnati in late 2007, 2008, when the Cubs had gotten the pennant mm-hmm. and they're playing Cincinnati, and then right after the game, we're in Cincinnati because my younger sister was going to grad school there. The Cincinnati Tourism Bureau stopped us. We we're in Cubs gear, and they took pictures of us while we we're wearing our Chicago stuff. And then they had a rally. The mayor of Cincinnati had a rally, and he didn't even have Reds players. He had Cubs players there. So I'm just letting you know. I think even in towns where there's another team. People are still more excited about the Cubs. All right. Well, okay. I guess I'm just going to have to learn to deal with that. Romana Hussein, it's always a blast talking to you. It's the Romana Rundown every Friday in the Ben Jarofsky Show. People saying, what's Maya doing in the studio? Maya has a blockbuster story. Yes, in this, I saw that. Uh, this week's reader, we got to get take the deep dive on it. And uh, so I'll have Maya on when we return. Today's Ben Jaromsky Show was brought to you in part by Chicago Architecture Center. See the city from a whole new angle on a Chicago Architecture Center tour. With more than 85 tours to choose from, there are endless stories to discover. Book your tour at architecture.org slash tours. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm on a tour. Oh my, what magnificent architecture. Read the Chicago Reader to get up to speed on what's what in Chicago. Culture. Food. Arts and entertainment, weekly concert listings, weekly event listings, the environment, travel. I can continue, but you get the point. And for all of you Chicago political junkies, raw weekly columns on real city politics from Maya Dukmasova and our very own Ben Jarofsky. The Chicago Reader, free to the public in newsstands throughout the city and online at chicagoreader.com. Read it now and be a more informed Chicagoan.
Cirque du Soleil's Big Top comes back to Chicago with its latest show, Volta. Venture into a captivating voyage of discovery inspired by the adventurous spirit of freedom where a surge of action sparks a high-voltage journey. Volta. Playing May 18th through July 6th under the Big Top at Soldier Field. Tickets at Cirque du Soleil.com. Volta thanks their partners Hennessy Black and Champagne Nicolas Fayette. All right, everybody, hour number two of your Ben Jarofsky show is moments away. But before we get into that, we would like to thank the following unions once again for jumping on board and bringing back the Ben Jarofsky show. First up, the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. A huge thank you to those guys for jumping on board and bringing back the Ben Jarofsky Show. And, of course, today's program is brought to you by our friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. Hour number two, let's go. Yes, it is Friday, May 17th. And live from the Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. In this hour of the program, we welcome back our Chicago Reader colleague, Maya Dukmasova, and it's In These Times writer, Micah Utrecht. And now your host, Chicago Reader columnist and the meanest air organ player <laughs> on the planet, Benny J. Bendrowski. Yes, indeed. Maya's in the studio. Maya's in the studio. Monster piece in uh, this week's reader. I have two copies of it. Not one, but two <laughs> copies of it, all right? Uh, and it's, by the way, it's it's like gone. I don't know if, if people looking for it in the West Loop. We're in the West Loop here. Oh, yeah? I, the boxes were empty? Two boxes. There were three boxes that I passed. Isn't that interesting? The reader does very well in the West Loop. Uh, and uh, two out of three uh, were empty, but the third one, I found a second copy. I have now three copies of the story. I got one at home, <laughs> two here. Uh, I'm old school, folks. I actually read the reader uh, in the reader. Yeah. So anyway, this is a super story uh, about the whole, well, the whole process of kicking people out of their homes, the eviction process. Here's the headline. Pangea has taken thousands of tenants to eviction court. The story of a post-recession apartment empire. I love that post-recession uh, apartment empire. Pangea is the name of a company. We're going to get into all the details with Maya, who must have worked like 50,000 years on this baby. Two Co years. Two years? Whoa. Two years, yeah. Wow. Damn. Yeah. This is this is like old school reader stuff, folks. Uh, back in the day, the Chicago Reader, my beloved Chicago Reader, I've been working them for them since 1984, uh, at least on a freelance base before Maya was born. Uh, and uh, but the Reader used to do these long form investigations. Uh, that were quite lengthy back in the day. Would be, there were, weren't the distractions that we have today, Maya, with phone, cell phones, etc. And people didn't worry so much about reading a long story. And then I noticed as the the eighties went into the nineties, and nineties went into the O's. People were like, "It's so long. It's too long." <laughs> yeah, but you know, people are still reading. I mean, we we've had like the the. I mean, it's hard to know. You know, with I I guess it's pretty indicative if the if the boxes are empty, people are picking it up. But our website traffic to the story was great yesterday and people were actually like the time that people were spending on the page like was indicative that they were actually reading it so it's like 13 and a half thousand words i mean i don't blame anyone for taking a while to read it it takes me like a week to read a story that long so yeah it's a kick-ass yeah. story i read it last night uh and uh, we have, we'll get uh, into the details but d you got an update for me absolutely i do so all this week we've been having quite frankly a ball reading quotes from our chicago mayor for three more days we're on the manual <laughs> And his exclusive oh, interview God. with Illinois Politico and one uh. Shia Campos. Yes, oh. today is Rom's last full business day as mayor. On Wednesday, before he rides off into the sunset, Rom bestowed his wisdom upon uh. us and gave us, uh, well, gave Illinois lawmakers advice on our governor's recreational cannabis legalization bill. <laughs> you okay over there? Oh my God, Rom on weed. 
Uh, his advice, uh, tread lightly. Oh, yeah. Thursday, we heard his advice on the possibility of casinos coming to Chicago. His advice, and what a fountain of knowledge this guy is, <laughs> tread lightly. <laughs> tread lightly. Same advice. Yeah. Recently, the city of Chicago was the eighth-ranked influential city worldwide, according to an A.T. Kearney report. Who? Yeah, that's what I thought, too. But an A.T. <laughs> Kearney report, and we have the mayor's thoughts on this one as well. The following comes from Shia Kapos and Illinois Politico. The mayor is thrilled, as uh, as can be, about a recent report that ranks Chicago number eight worldwide of influential cities. The mayor credits the high ranking for a focus on the fundamentals, aviation, mass transit, oh, universities, God. research, and digital high tech. Here's the quote from Mayor Rahm. Remember, of course, he's smart, you are not. Quote, <laughs> we position Chicago for the future. Uh, and that led him to talk about that uh, one thing he always talks about when bragging on himself education oh yeah like he did anything for education Uh uh-huh here's the quote he's been big fan of ron by the way all right quote here's the quote from ron quote income inequality which is the biggest challenge we have is really a diploma divide we've made education a bridge to a future rather than a dividing issue ben something you'd like to say uh what can i say other than uh the inequity between the poorest people in the city of Chicago and the wealthier people in the city of Chicago when it comes to education is best typified by, let's say, the tuition that Mayor Rahm paid for his kid to go to a private school. It's in the 30s of thousands of dollars, I want to say. And the amount, average amount that we spend on a public school child, which I think this, when you add up all the money, it's like fourteen dollars to $15,000. And I'm really being rough with my estimations i'm doing this off the top of my head the point is if we're going to spend over thirty thousand dollars to educate the richest of the rich at our most exclusive private schools then we should say you know what if we really want to do build what does he say build a bridge from equity to inequity or whatever that bridge is that he's building then let's spend thirty thousand dollars per kid let's let's be true to what we say we believe in if we really believe that schools are the way to smash down the barriers that divide the poorest from the richest then let's back it up no more money for Lincoln Yards, no more money for 78, no more money for whatever the building is on the Chicago, uh, the banks of the Chicago River right across from the old Sun-Times building. Stop throwing money away. No more money for the Wind Trust where the Paul plays its basketball. Let's put the money uh, educating our poorest of the poor. But everybody who lives in the city of Chicago knows, and you all know, folks, you know what, how this game is played, that we've been pushing poor people out of this city. We're going to talk about that with Maya in this story because we don't want to pay for them. So stop pretending like your administration was all about spending money to build up our public schools to break down these divides. There, that's what I think about that. All right, one more quick update. Like I said, it's Rom's last full business day as a mayor, and I know this next piece of news has been bumming out our current guest all this week. Maya, your favorite podcast is coming to an end. Uh, <laughs> yes. What am I going to do? I've been wondering the same thing all week for you. Well, yes, Rahm Emanuel's Chicago <laughs> Stories podcast is coming to a close. On his last show, Emanuel talks about how he got into politics and the millions of political lessons he learned from former President Bill Clinton. Ugh. Oh, he's, he even does an impression <laughs> of Bill Clinton. And really? his final interview... He yeah. His final interview, Chicago broadcaster Bill Curtis. Oh, he inter- wait. If anybody needs to, you know, substitute Ambien tonight, <laughs> they can go ahead and uh, and opt for that. Uh, before she wrote this great investigation about evictions in the city of Chicago, Maya slogged through about 10 hours. I 18 wanted. hours. Oh, I'm, my bad. It's 18 hours of uh, Rom's podcast. Uh, Rom's Ode to Himself. She wrote a very, I thought it was a funny article. Um, and uh, she did it, so I wouldn't have to do it. All right, Maya, let's get down to business yeah, here. Yeah, perfect transition, actually. Uh, Rom has received uh, about eleven thousand dollars from Pangea, okay, the city's biggest filer of eviction cases, uh, since he became mayor, and uh, that sec that came in second to only one other pol- local politician who received political contributions from the company, which is Eighth Ward Alderman Michelle Harris. Uh, in whose ward uh, a tremendous number of uh, Pangea's buildings are concentrated. She's gotten about $18,000 from them. All right, let's break it down uh, point by point for our listeners who may not have had the opportunity to read your story. And I urge everybody, after today's show, 
check it out. But not now, because listen to Maya right now. <laughs> All right, so uh, explain to folks what Pangea is. Yeah, so Pangea is a, a real estate, it's a private real estate investment trust. So it's a, it's a private company that um, uh, buys and owns and operates um, apartment buildings. And uh, they're, the, the way that they are structured as a company makes it um, completely opaque. Like there's no public filings. There's nothing about their finances that's, that's really publicly available. So there's not a ton um, that we know about the, uh, the, the kind of internal business workings of the company. And by the way, we have a tips at chicagoreader.com email address that's tips at chicagoreader.com where if you have any kind of tips about Pangea or know anything about their business please send an email there with the subject line Pangea and we'd love to hear from you but anyway so back in 2009 uh, this company started operating this was at the in the in the depths of the foreclosure crisis you had tons and tons of apartment buildings in Chicago that were foreclosed abandoned boarded up bank owned buildings and the people who started this company had just sold a very successful payday lending business to a publicly traded company that based in Texas. Uh, these folks were suddenly had tons of money to invest right when real estate was very, very cheap. And so they, they started buying up buildings by the block in neighborhoods like South Shore, Chatham, Auburn Gresham, Austin, places where there are, uh, where, where, where it's uh, relatively apartment dense. So if you think about your typical Chicago courtyard apartment building, you know, maybe, um, you know, 10, 20, 50 units um, in a, usually a brick building. And especially in the, in the communities closer to the lakefront, um, there's lots of those buildings. I mean, South Shore has a ton of them. Um, and uh, yeah, so the company in has invested like about four hundred million dollars, according to them, in in buying and rehabbing these properties, and leasing them back out. Um, the way they describe it is like this is workforce housing. This is like affordable housing for the working class. But don't you know m affordable housing? Meaning that that's how they are presenting it. But in reality, like this is not subsidized housing. This is just private market housing, aimed at uh, low income people who live in these neighborhoods. So um, they. Uh, Essentially, that that how I started digging into this story was I started um, getting eviction data from the uh, clerk of the Circuit Court of Cook County a couple of years ago. I started requesting data because after reading Matt uh, Desmond's book, Evicted. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, what is going on with evictions yep. in Chicago? And I realized that nobody was doing any kind of reporting on it. Um, and I started uh, making these data requests and receive, started receiving hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, basically case level information, uh, data points from the clerk of the circuit court. And once I started crunching the numbers, I was like, all right, well, let's see, like, who are the landlords filing these cases? Mm -hmm. And I very quickly saw that there, this company was filing a disproportionate number of cases. In the last 10 years, they filed more than 9,000 cases. That's more than the next four landlords combined. So uh, most of the biggest filers are property management companies that are sort of um, middlemen kind of landlord figures. So somebody owns a building and they hire a property manager to run it. And uh, there's a graph in the story that you can kind of see the degree of disproportionality there. Um, so uh, even though, so Pangea is an owner operator. So they say that like, it's not really fair to compare them to some of these other property managers, but some of these property managers are running, are, are managing properties in very similar neighborhoods to Pangea's. So, um, so yeah, so I started, I, I started looking into them after seeing them show up in this strange way in in the court records. Um, I w worked with a couple of students from Medill at Northwestern. Uh, we did, we observed more than a hundred eviction court hearings um, with, with Pangea and, the, and their tenants. Um, we talked to dozens of tenants um, with uh, former employees of the company, with, uh, you know, experts, with lawyers on the tenant and landlord side of the bar that practice in eviction court. And um, the kind of, uh, what came out of this is essentially an, uh, the, a view of a company that built its entire business on like, um, you know, taking advantage of this like problem in the real estate market after the foreclosure crisis and uh, taking advantage of a situation in which you had tons of little mom and pop landlords who used to own these buildings 
They were foreclosed on. The banks that used to finance them uh, went out of business as well during the recession. The bailout did not extend to little community banks like Shore Bank or Park National Bank on the west side. All these banks went under and nobody, no, the federal government did not bail them out. Those were the banks that used to finance mom and pop lo- local landlords that would own a building or two in, in neighborhoods like South Shore and Chatham. And so the only people with access to capital in this vacuum were people with with venture capital, with Wall Street connections, which is who these guys who started the company were. Um, And they did very well with their payday lending business. Uh, It was uh, an online payday lender called CashNet USA that they that they started. Um, They sold it. It was very successful. I think they they generated good returns for their investors. And essentially, yeah, they they pulled together a bunch of investments, pulled their own money into it and bought up a bunch of buildings. So, yeah, and I mean, the goal of the story really is to show, to try to, you know, tell the history of this company and how a company like this comes to be, but also to show like what the effect that eviction has on people, because we have a, a tremendous amount of like misconceptions and misunderstandings about like what eviction, how eviction impacts people, what are the consequences? Who are the people getting evicted? Um, most folks wind up in eviction court because they, that's like, it's like 20 to 25,000 people in Chicago every year. Most of them are black winding up in eviction court. Most of them are also women. Um, and, uh, you know, people get laid off. People have a medical emergency. People have car trouble. They, uh, are paying more than half of their income in rent very often. And so, you know, any, minor financial emergency will put you in a situation where you can't scrape together the rent. So these Pangea apartments, they cost, you know, seven to nine hundred dollars, sometimes a thousand dollars a month for a two bedroom. So it's uh, it, it's really it, it, it's challenging to to pay that much in rent and to to be on secure footing. So um, I just wanted to sh- have the story also be a vehicle to explain to people like wh- how you know, who is getting evicted and why, and also like how the eviction court system works. Because I hear a lot, especially from smaller landlords, little kind of mom and pop operators, like, oh, eviction court is stacked against tenants and they're just taking advantage. There's like the professional tenants who are taking advantage of people who are taking advantage of the system to like stay in a unit and not pay. But the reality is that like most people who are taken to eviction court are ultimately evicted. Mm -hmm. Most tenants, like 80% of tenants do not have a lawyer. A third of tenants get evicted the very first day they're in court. So within two weeks of the eviction case being filed on them. And um, the system is is really far from fair. Well, this article works on many levels. And uh, I'm gonna read one of my, I think my favorite sentence in the article. Um, It's a long article, so (laughs) there's a lot of competition for this, the favorite sentence uh, claim. It's difficult to overstate the degree of historical disinterest in the eviction of renters in Chicago, a city where issues of race and poverty have been meticulously scrutinized by academics, the media, and the government for decades. I love that line. It's difficult to overstate the degree of historical disinterest. And one of the things that struck me about this story, uh, Maya, is like there's so much going on uh, in this story. You're dealing with so many issues. On the one hand, you're talking about the, the emergence of this company, Pangea, and what that says about how corporations raise the money they need to become players in various industries. We see with Uber, the money they're raising to take control and decimate taxi industry, you know, mm-hmm. in various cities. Uh, so the, it's a story about Pangea's rise and, and like you said, how they turned that payday loan uh, business into a, a lots of money when they sold it and then bought this company. It's a story about this, the process, the raw bureaucratic process of our court system and how it just chews people up and spits them out. They just total indifference, cold-blooded indifference to the struggles that people are having. And then it's a story about life in the city of Chicago in the, what did they say it on the front page? I don't know if that's your story or if there's some uh, editors. Post-recession, uh, these days. Post- that was me. Oh, yeah. Well, post-recession. Maya, right in your own headlines now. Uh, but the post-recession era. And it's just like such a kind, because we, t- we were talking, I was going on my one of my many tirades about Rom, but Rom to me, his, uh, his uh, tenure just sort of represents the fact, the way uh, like powerful people just 
use everything at their disposal to, to accentuate their power. Everybody else is in a way gets crushed. Yeah. And your story on like three different levels is like ex- is like state exhibit A, if you will, of what's been going on in this town for the last ten years. Yeah, and it's and it's such a like it, it's it's such a like kind of co- nuanced thing to untangle because on the one hand, it's undeniable that this company has like brought back online housing that was dilapidated, foreclosed, boarded up, not functional, right? Mm-hmm. But the root problem is that w- it's the the mechanisms that could finance a healthy local real estate market where the owners of these properties are invested in the neighborhoods where they're located because there are people who also live in these neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. It's it, it the, the 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 result of the financial crisis was that this like community based financing banking model was completely destroyed and so and it was in large part destroyed because of the this you know huge housing crisis that's like what what precipitated you know this financial crisis is this housing bubble which was in large part driven by like wall street and mm-hmm. wall street banks approach to, to to the housing market right but those are the banks that get bailed out and those are the people like people connected to those banks are the people that have the capital to invest in this dilapidated real estate that was foreclosed on and went under because of the of of the collapsing of the system those very banks built mm-hmm. so like al goldstein in 2003 the founder of pangea he was interning at deutsche bank and he told me that when we were interviewing, you know, he said that like he didn't find investment banking very meaningful. And he was reading this was a quote from him. Like he said, he said he was like reading a lot of rich dad, poor dad books mm-hmm. and, you know, wanted to get into real estate. And then he had a mentor who was like an options trader in Chicago who, you know, pitched him on this idea of payday lending. And it's like when it came time to start Pangea, some of the some of the you know, the some of the board members of, of this company. Like we have like Norman Bobbins and Jim Reynolds who are huge local titans of finance that are board members of this company. And then we have like a couple of people who are, you know, just con- connected, like they're connected to big banks. So I, I think that it's really crucial that like, uh, you know, a lot of people are gonna read the story and take away kind of all kinds of negative perceptions about Pangea and I'm not saying that's wrong, but I think that it's really important to understand the kind of wider context of what, like an entire financial system that and, and a banking system that incentivizes the existence of companies like this that creates like pitfalls in yeah. uh in our in in our in our housing system and our banking system for uh potentially predatory f- practices to to flourish essentially so yeah um i feel like and and in our city the 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 principal problem and this isn't just a chicago problem but it's but it's definitely i I don't know i I would hope that the new various new politicians that we've got coming in are going to be paying attention to this but we know almost nothing about private landlords in the city and there's a billion different mom and pop landlords who may own you know a two flat that they rent out their uh, the other unit in or own a couple of buildings here and there but like Pangea owns 400 buildings in the city and there's not even a way to like go somewhere and say, well, where are all of their buildings and what is the state of their buildings? Mm -hmm. Like Department of Buildings is supposed to do inspections on these buildings. And if the landlord doesn't let them in, they can't go in. They can't, they they have no right to actually enter a building unless the landlord volunteers to let them in. One of the things I discovered as I was looking at these buildings, because, you know, I was getting reports from tenants about like rats and bed bugs and uh, structural problems in the buildings and all kinds of, you know, uh, unsavory things on the inside of the buildings I go to the Department of Buildings records I'm like well what did the inspections show Mm -hmm. and so many of these inspections the buildings fail the inspections because the inspector can't get inside and it'll it'll just say like in the city records the note will be like no you know no response from Pangea like no response from building manager can't access the building so then they'll cite them for something that they see on the outside but the eventual pot the only possible eventual recourse to that is like maybe there's a building court case that you know takes forever to even begin to file so we we really know very little about um you know who the landlords are where their buildings are and how they're operating and beyond even the state of the buildings we don't really know like how much a company like this is profiting off of off of Uh, the rent Mm -hmm. and the conventional wisdom is that well the cost of operating in poor neighborhoods is really high because you're taking on all this risk by renting out to poor people because they're more likely to default 
But uh, there's actually some new research coming out by the by the author of Evicted, Matt Desmond. There's an article that I reference in the story that he just published in uh, in January that actually did an analysis uh, nationwide uh, and also like in in uh, in Milwaukee in particular. But but that that shows that la- landlords are in, po- in in poor neighborhoods reap more in profits from every one of their units than landlords in middle income and rich neighborhoods. Other than in places like New York and San Francisco, where if you're a landlord and you're property that you own is is like in the wealthiest mm. neighborhoods there you'll make more profit than those in poor ones but every in every other type of market you make more profit as a landlord from renting to the poor than you would renting to the rich well i we have regressive taxation i guess we i shouldn't be surprised we're regressive housing you mentioned deutsche bank by mm-hmm. the way that's uh, uh, triggered a thought in my head uh deutsche bank was the big lender for Trump Tower. All the yeah. stories I'm talking about today are coming together. We were talking about that earlier with Romana. And um, they they had to end up forgiving so many uh, bad uh, bad Trump loans. Uh, they were in and out of court with each other. Trump would sue them to try mm-hmm. to avoid having these obligations. It's so funny, the, the lessons that this fellow, this young fellow who runs Pangea Learn from Deutsche Bank, uh, do, Donald Trump, the double standards here in this country, when a poor person, uh, <laughs> life loses control of his or her life and can't pay the rent, they send him to eviction court. When Donald Trump uh, can't pay his obligations to Deutsche Bank, he sues Deutsche Bank mm-hmm. and then wins. Uh, he wins concessions from them. The system clearly works different ways and at different advantages. And yeah. Donald Trump would probably be the first person to say the tenants in eviction courts are deadbeats, which of is course. interesting. Yeah. He himself is a deadbeat. <laughs> um, so, all right. So in terms of the larger implications for, let's say, uh, Lori Lightfoot or uh, the people who are going to make our housing policies going forward in the city of Chicago, yeah. what do you, what are your recommendations? Well, so I would say that the, the number one, so, the number one problem is right now we are operating in an information vacuum. We we don't have we don't have any research or any specific like Chicago tailored studies of what is actually going on in the neighborhood housing markets. What's who the landlords are? How much are they profiting? And so unt- I feel like it's. There are, there's all kinds of policy proposals on the table that may like make eviction court processes more fair that could ease the burden on renters such as you know rent control or universal basic income because like the fundamental problem is like if if people are getting evicted because they don't have enough money for rent the rent needs to be cheaper or they need to have more money yeah. like it's it's like kind of ba- like a basic physics type of thing right so um uh, you know there there's there's big sweeping pro- policy proposals that are that are you know, understandably quite controversial. And I'm not saying that those policies wouldn't help, but I'm just saying that like, when we're in an information vacuum, it's really hard to know how exactly to talk, tackle a problem because we don't know the scope of the problem. So my first thing like that I would recommend is we need to invest like city resources in like actually quantifying the problem. Like we need to know how much money a company like Pangea makes from renting out their units and have a uh, have have a, a really clear understanding of what the quality of the housing is. Like, you know, we have lead ordinances and bed bug ordinances and all these kinds of tenant, you know, sort of on the books. It, it looks like tenant protections, but uh, again, like an inspector can't just get inside the property because it's a private property and w- w- there's no, the, the enforcement of these things is really lax. So I would say that it's, yeah, we need to, we need to really devote meaningful attention to studying the problem. Um, and uh, policy wise, I mean, it, it's, it's really important to listen to the people who are directly impacted by this. I mean, people who are, you know, pushing for rent control, who want to limit the amount of uh, rent increases that, 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 you know, the percentage of uh, how much your rent can grow every year like they're not just you know the, the shooting from the hip on this stuff like they're actually doing research in the neighborhoods they're talking to people who are affected by this and i think it's important to pay attention to for example like something like the lift the ban coalition but it's also important to pay attention to landlords and people who who kind of represent um 
property interest. And I say that because there's actually, well, one of the most interesting things about researching the story is that I found that there's actually like quite a lot of irritation and annoyance and dislike of Pangea among other landlords. People know about this company and they don't like the what how they see these folks operating. But uh, there's, we, we don't really, I feel like in the media and in, among organizing communities, we sort of lump all uh, landlords together as being like, well, these are like, you know, property interests. These people are like kind of represent capital. But I think that there are ways to have these conversations that like sort of get at the deeper problem. So like a mom and pop landlord, mm -hmm. pan, like Pangea is as much a problem for them as uh as they are for a tenant. Yeah. I think that there's more in common between your average Chicago mom and pop landlord and a tenant than there are between Pangea and most landlords in the city. Well, this um, the whole issue of how we can adjust city policy to try to make Chicago um, more affordable, I guess is the simplest way to say it, uh, is a compelling problem. And I, I've been learning this from the people who come into the studio. Uh, there's healthcare. Uh, there uh, is college debt mm -hmm. issues. Uh, this is for the next generation. And all of this of people. drains people's wallets. That's how why they wind up in eviction and housing, court, right? And housing <laughs> is and housing costs. So it's like yeah. the big three whammy. Uh, Maya, uh, thank you very much for doing it again. Uh, eviction court: the story of post -res post recession apartment empire. It's in uh, this week's reader, right there. That's the reader. Pick it folks. up. Pick it up or read it online if you must. Uh, There's lots of great graphics, so. No, it is really definitely great worth your That's time. That's not, you know, it's not <laughs> that bad going online to read. Uh, and Maya will be back Tuesday, and we will be talking about uh, the inauguration of our new mayor. Uh, Lori Lightfoot. Yeah, well, I'll see you on Monday at the inauguration. Yeah, well, that's a whole other story. And when yeah. I got to get my column done, get to that inauguration, and to get to lunch with my, I got a lot of things going on Sunday. I mean, on Monday. So anyway, one way or another, I'll see you uh, probably Monday and Tuesday. Tuesday here uh, in the studio talking about the new mayor and the old mayor. We may talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the old mayor as well. All right, Maya, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Micah is on deck. We're going to bring him on. going to shift gears, talk a little more national politics. He's going to be talking about Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, two of my favorite topics of conversation. <laughs> uh, so we'll take a break and be right back. Did you know that 40% of the people in Illinois opt to be cremated? Well, it's true. And Chicagoland Cremation Options honors their wishes by providing cremation services directly to the general public. Chicagoland Cremation Options provides an affordable, ethical, and easy cremation arrangement, whether in person or online. Save thousands and streamline the process by going directly to Chicagoland Cremation Options. It's a family-owned business operated by my good friend, Douglas Klein. Here's how you reach them. ChicagolandCremationOptions.com. One more time. ChicagolandCremationOptions.com. It's Chicagoland's adult entertainment playground. It's the world famous Admiral Theater, 3940 West Lawrence Avenue. The Admiral is homegrown from Chicago, and it's the most conveniently located club in all of the city. 15 minutes from the O'Hare Airport in downtown Chicago Loop. Voted Chicago's best strip club, the Admiral has showgirls galore and a variety of adult entertainment shows. The world famous Admiral Theater, open every day from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m., 3940 West Lawrence Avenue. For events, showtime, and other information, visit AdmiralX.com. Must be 18 years of age or older to enter. Read the Chicago Reader to get up to speed on what's what in Chicago. Culture, food, arts and entertainment, weekly concert listings, weekly event listings, the environment, travel. I can continue, but you get the point. And for all of you Chicago political junkies, raw weekly columns on real city politics from Maya Dukmasova and our very own Ben Jarofsky. The Chicago Reader, free to the public in newsstands throughout the city and online at chicagoreader.com. Read it now and be a more informed Chicagoan. Hey, everybody, what you're about to hear are the piano stylings of Jeff Manuel. Man, listen to Jeff go. Jeff Manuel has been playing piano around Chicago for years. He's played for conventions, for celebrities, played in basement bars with blues bands. He's played at prestigious social clubs, fine restaurants, and in the intimacy of private homes. Book Jeff Manuel at jeffemanuelpianist.com. 
Don't worry, I'll spell his name at the end of this commercial. You know what Chicago Magazine said? They said that Jeff Manuel is, quote, as comfortable with Chopin as he is with Cole Porter. He's excellent, and his performance is joyous. He offers an elegant stream of compositions and interpretations that entertains the mind, but won't hurt the ears. To hear more of Jeff Manuel's work and to book Jeff for your next event, go to jeffmanuelpianist.com. I'm going to spell it out for you, people. J E F F M as in Mary, A N as in Nancy, U E L P I A N I S T.com. Take it away, Jeff Manuel. Commercial break over. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show. Yes, indeed. Mikey Utrick is in the studio. Jacobin Magazine. He's some kind of big shot over there. Also in these times. Also, he has a podcast, a uh, vast majority. Wrote a book on the Chicago school teacher strike. I know a lot about this guy. He's sitting right there. He's getting ready to talk some serious Bernie Sanders talk. He's writing a book about Bernie Sanders, D. How much time does this guy have? Man, huh? Making you sound like really like lazy. You know why? Because he doesn't spend his time watching basketball games. <laughs> Like I did last night. Can I just say something? Portland Trail Blazers. Actually, you see that thing? I watched that. It's a that basket. That was, Put, <laughs> they didn't shoot the ball, Micah. Oh, I'm no. scared. <laughs> shoot the ball. Sorry, Micah. Calm that, down. <laughs> wait, you were. Wait a minute. Time out. I just that was my excuse. I'm not writing books and doing that because da, 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 I'm watching basketball. But you watched. You found time to watch the game last night. I mean, it's the playoffs. You got to watch those games, especially the ones that we've been having lately with these like coming down to buzzer beater shots. Or last night with the you know the strip right at the end. Strip foul? Yes or no, Mike? I couldn't the stand. see. I couldn't see from that camera angle. You couldn't see if it's his hands or not. What it looked a like a strip from dodge. behind. But I mean, I wanted the Blazers to win. But you let know. me tell you something. Okay, Andre Iguodala, one step away from taking a two-by-four and hitting him over the head with it to get the ball. And the referee, I see nothing. That's why he ran out of there. Because yeah, he, he ran out of there. He knew man. he had he blood like, on his hands. Good God, it was He's a like, mugging. I got away with this. I got to just, they, they can't take this back from me. I got to get out of here. I'm getting out of here before Flood they take the scene of the crime. Yeah, that was, folks, uh, Damian Lillard was mugged at the end of last night's Warriors game. That's not that the Warriors are a great team. They're a great team, but it's hard to lose when you're a great team. And the referees swallowed a whistle. At the crucial moment. All right, D, you got an update for me? Absolutely, I do. And that's the sports. Uh, <laughs> that's the sports for the day. That's it. Oh, man, he's so hard on me, this guy. All right, three <laughs> quick updates here. First off, okay. uh, well, right now, post on both Ben Jarofsky Facebook and Twitter pages at Benny J Show, B E N N Y, the letter J Show. It's the latest Chicago Reader column from our very own Ben Jarofsky. Ben, why don't you tell them about your uh, latest article oh, here, the man. article titled Race to the Bottom. <laughs> oh, Micah, sounds- you get a kick out of this one. Uh, so, uh, it, it, Mick Dumkey at the hideout last week, uh, we, there were, we still had a hideout show, even though Micah had a, uh, a competing show that night. Uh, if I had and, known, uh, I wouldn't have done that to you. Anyway, it's all good. But anyway, uh, uh, Mick asked me point blank uh, in front of a group of people, uh, who, did I, who do I like better as a mayor? Uh, Rom or Daly, Richard M. Daly, and I was I was stunned. I didn't know what to say. Usually, I have something to say about everything, but I was like Jackie Gleason, habada, habada. and I didn't know what to say. And so I thought about it, and I I flipped the question, Micah. Instead of who is the better mayor, who is the who is the worst mayor? And so I posed that question in the reader, and I went through it, and I came to the conclusion. Should I give away my conclusion? No. Or should I make them read it? Yeah. Read the damn story, people. After. Uh, after. After. <laughs> after the show. After. You listen to uh, this, get done listening, then read. Oh, read Maya's article and then read Ben's article. Yeah, well, read mine first because Maya's is a lot longer, all right? Oh, way and, to say that when she's not here. Oh, I know. Is she gone? Oh, no, she's coming back. All right, so. No, read uh, Maya's excellent story. At Benny J Show, B-E-N-N-Y, the letter J Show. Mm-hmm. And uh, while you're on the pages, like, give us a like, follow, share, review. Tell us we're awful. Whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. It's fine. You know, we'll see it. All right. Uh, two quick updates here. Number one on uh, President Donald Trump. President Donald Trump has announced a deal with Canada and Mexico that would scrap major tariffs, ending a simmering trade dispute that began when the president imposed tariffs on imported steel and aluminum in the name of national security. Uh, that's about all we need to know on that one. And it looks like Lori Lightfoot 
is choosing her city council leaders here. Uh, Mayor-elect Lori Lightfoot has chosen a, this comes from uh, the one and only Fran the Woman Spielman, by the way, on uh, Chicago Sun-Times. Mayor-elect Lori Lightfoot has chosen a rainbow team to lead the city council. That includes Alderman Scott Waggispack as finance committee chairman, Ooh. Alderman Pat Dowell as budget chairman, mm. and Tom Tunney as zoning chairman. <laughs> they gave Tunney zoning? Yep. <laughs> That's the deal they got. Oh my! Is that is that final or is that proposed? It looks like it's final. Wow, Scotty w- Waggis back got to be finance chair, and uh, of course, it's interesting if McDumkey were here, he would say this. I'll say it for him not being here. Why is Lori Lightfoot? the executive, the head of the executive branch. Remember, there are three branches of government, everybody. There's the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. The executive is the mayor, or like in the in the, in the national, it's the president. You learn a lot of stuff on this show, Micah. And uh, so why does the president get to pick who the leaders of Congress are? This is a vexing question. Only in Chicago is it considered healthy to have so much power in one person. That sounds like a weak mayor system to me. That's what I always hear about this. Yeah, it's supposed to be weak mayor, but the mayor has all the power. Anyway, I love Scott. Scotty Wag is back. I'm sure he'll do a good job. Fine. He can't be worse than the guy who had the job for the last 30 years or whatever it was, uh, Ed Burke. So, uh, so that's good. After you read Maya's article, after you read Ben's article, go check out Chicago Sun Times. Or, you know, if you want to check out Micah's articles as well, then go check out the Chicago Sun Times article. That's correct. With uh, Alderman Scott Wag is back and all the other city council mm-hmm. leaders being announced. That's interesting. Scotty Wag is back. It's going to be the finest year. Wow. All right, uh, Micah. So but before we take the deep dive and uh, your thoughts on Bernie Sanders, uh, you cover Chicago politics as well. You live here in the city of Chicago. You know what's going on in the city. In your humble opinion, who is worse, Mayor Rahm or Mayor Daley? Well... <laughs> <laughs> this is like uh, you know, death by electrocution or lethal injection. Here. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, Daly kind of paved the way for the stuff that Rom was up to in the city. I mean, Rom was the more zealous uh, embracer and advocate of privatization and and sort of austerity measures in the city and fighting against you know taking on the CTU and doing all the the bad stuff the giving away of city dollars through TIF funds one of your favorite uh, topics I mean this is he he just was clearly a, like a like a true believer in that stuff but he couldn't have just shown up uh, one day and done that without ha- daily having paved the way for him so um, it's it's hard to really to they, they need each other you know the, 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 the daily need, uh, Rom needed daily in order to carry out his agenda. All right, so you're gonna say it's a tie? Is that what you're saying? I'm just saying you can't say one is better than the other. It's just I didn't like say there are one, one, one is worse or worse. <laughs> well, I'll take I'll take Rom as being worse just because you know he he, he had the way prepared for him, but he was the one who actually you know delivered the hammer blow down. All right, city, he so. said he go he weighs in on Rom being worse. Thank you, Chicago, for this humbling <laughs> victory. All I can say, you sure know uh, how to make a guy feel at home. Yeah. Uh, Mick, by the way, uh, Mick Dumkey, I interviewed him. He'll be that'll be a uh, uh, on Saturday show, uh, he weighed in on this one as well, uh, and uh, he too chose Rom as the worst of the two. Uh, all right, now let's move on, uh, Micah, and uh, talk about uh, Bernie Sanders and national politics a little bit. Um, you're about to talk about this. You're about to write a book uh, on the issue on the subject of Bernie Sanders, more or less. Talk about that. Yeah, well, I'm uh, haven't written it yet, so you know. <laughs> well, hurry so up! Get, get Stop out watching here. basketball. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm co-writing a book with uh, Jacobin staff writer Megan Day. It's called tentatively titled uh, "Bigger Than Bernie." That is about. It's not just about Bernie, but it's kind of about what the lessons that we've learned in uh, American politics over the last couple of years from the Bernie Sanders campaign, as well as this broader rise in socialism in, in the United States, this uh, the detoxification of that term socialism, mm-hmm. and uh, what we can be, build, as, as the title suggests, bigger than Bernie. What, you know, what other people, what, what, what do we learn about how electoral politics can be used to widen the scope of what's politically possible mm-hmm. uh, in the United States? Uh, what have we learned about how social movements like uh, unions and the teacher strike wave, how, how is that related to what Bernie Sanders has done, and and you know what what do we need in those kind of social movements uh, to complement the the sort of rising left electoral stuff that we've seen through Bernie or through Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and those kind of folks. So uh, it's going to be a kind of uh, you know socialist roadmap for where we go from from here, whether or not Bernie wins the uh, Democratic nomination or the election in 2020. What have we learned and where should we go to build off of this momentum? All right. Now let's talk about that concept of bigger than Bernie. This is a favorite topic here uh, on the show, not as particularly bigger than Bernie. 
Uh, but who is it? Was it Stephen Smith? He's running for um, governor of West Virginia as a Democrat, and uh, he was passing through town, and he did it. He was gracious enough to sit down for an interview, and he said, and I'm paraphrasing him, that is in a humble opinion. One of the uh, problems facing the Democratic Party is that there's this um, how do, how does he put it? Uh, emphasis on celebrity, emphasis on the individual. Emphasis on like the cult of the personality. We see it from the sort of the center with uh, the baby mayor of uh, Saint, uh, South Bend. I'm blanking. Uh, Peter, Buttigieg. Mayor Pete. Yeah, Buttigieg. Yeah. Uh, people, you know, they don't even know what he represents, but they like him. It's right. a celebrity. It's somebody new. It's different. And uh, he was saying he believes this, this uh, Smith, who's running in West Virginia, we, believe we should have movements. Um, Bernie Sanders, his whole career has been a movement man, and yet now he's become the distillation. You know, he has become a ce celebrity. He is Bernie. So when you say bigger than Bernie, are you talking about you'd like to see a movement that's bigger than one man? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, for example. I think that the what the Democratic Socialists of America are doing is trying to build that bigger movement that's bigger than just one guy. But even Bernie himself, his whole campaign slogan right now is not me, us, right? That's what he's shouting from the, the mouth tops right now he wants something bigger than him because he recognizes both if he wins like let's say he does somehow we have a president bernie sanders he's arguing on the campaign trail that he won't be able to get much done unless he's got some bigger movement behind him to force through things like medicare for all he, we need a grassroots movement that can overcome the pressures of the health insurance companies and everybody else who's going to be moving heaven and earth to try to stop this mm -hmm. thing uh, and as well as if he, he doesn't win i mean we, we we need some we need we need multiple people as i said like People running in local elections, people running in national elections, people uh, building strong unions, people building other kind of social movements for affordable housing or whatever. We need all of those movements in order to carry out, you know, to, to win the kind of society uh, that's decent and livable for and democratic for everyone that Bernie's campaign represents for a lot of people. Mm, Democrat, small d, democratic. Uh, right. Won't be able to get something done. You said that in, while you were in passing, while you were moving forward. Uh, so many Democrats. Uh, who are to the right in, in this total political spectrum of Bernie, tell me all the time, Ben, you're misguided uh, in uh, talking about Bernie or championing Bernie or voting for Bernie. Uh, Bernie will not be able to get anything done. You're unrealistic. And stop being unrealistic. <laughs> people tell me that for many, many years, Micah. So when you hear that, what do you think when people say Bernie won't be able to get anything done? What do you think about that? Well, I think about somebody like, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is an example, right? She is one of maybe, you know, two or three other people with Rashida Tlaib from Michigan and others who identify as democratic socialists who are in the House right now, right? Mm -hmm. One out of over 400 of the representatives who are in the House. And yet, look at how she has totally reshaped the political conversation in the United States in an extremely short amount of time since she took office. We're talking about the Green New Deal. We're having all these conversations. Again, the 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 horizon of political possibility has expanded because we have this tiny minority, you know, this, this socialist who is out there uh, just making very bold political claims and, and, and arguing for very bold left-wing policies. And pe you know, public opinion is shifting in this rapid fire rate. And we're you just we're the conversation that we're having in this country has totally changed just because we've had a small handful of people who are bringing up these ideas. So I think there's a real outsized influence, especially at a time when people feel so beaten down right now and they feel like, you know, life is really miserable. They feel ground down by austerity. They ground down by student debt and medical debt and all of the rising cost of living and all of these things that make uh, life in this country often uh, pretty grim for a lot of people when they hear something bold, not just a little tinkering at the edges and technocratic uh, you know, policy fixes by uh, centrist Democrats, but people who are saying, no, the system is really messed up and we have to reshape the entire thing. We have to do something as bold as the Green New Deal or, or, or uh, we have to do something as bold as liquidate the uh, private medical insurance company uh, industry. Uh, they're responding to that. Uh, so to me, that is a far 
more uh, transformative way of doing politics, and it's one that I think, w- ironically, will get a lot more done. It, maybe not in the way that your friends who are uh, chastising you for talking about <laughs> Bernie would oh appreciate, but but it's changing the terrain upon which we're having all of these political debates in society as a whole. So I think that is a you know, if you want to get stuff done, if you want to get good progressive things done, I think that's the best way to do it. Well, it's uh, it's funny that you should say that. Yes, I get chastised a lot, and I do think this is a generational debate to a large degree. I talked about this earlier in the show it's making fun of my generation it's the easy generation to make fun of uh, but so many of the uh, i'm soft on your generation it's better than the generation after yours generation x uh trying they to kind okay, of drop the ball let's not now that we're in a discussion like which is the worst mayor daily or rom which is the worst generation baby boomers or gen x that's a tough one i, I love baby boomers some maybe good you yeah some good stuff baby, the music was good the, definitely baby Definitely baby boomer uh, culture is way better than Gen X culture. There's no question about it. Even Dennis agrees with me on that one. But um, uh, I, I don't know. Baby boomers, that's pretty bad. Anyway, but so, moving on. Sorry, but many, uh, you, you got me distracted. <laughs> uh, it happens very easily yeah. to our house. <laughs> no, no. But uh, I, I would have to say that the, the baby boomers are locked into these just – notions bedded and anchored in 1972 in the George McGovern campaign and they they just can't shake them and I just all these uh, young uh, progressives not come into the studio they that that world doesn't even exist to them I had a a young uh, woman come in here yesterday Kim Ortiz were passionate plea for uh, forgiving college debt and was talking about the onerous obligations that young people are facing with college debt and so many geezers of the baby junior JJ, hey, I paid my debt. You know what I mean? It's like- Well, the most prominent one of them all, Joe Biden is out there on the campaign trail. Yeah, well, right Papa now. Joe. Now yeah. I bet you Papa Joe, he's seeing which way the flag is flying. He will go quickly in the direction <laughs> of, hey, my grandchildren are gonna have to worry about that. You watch, Micah, he will move to the left if that's what it takes. I hope so, because I'm trying to get some forgiveness of these student loans. I'm dying out here. You are Somebody. dying out here. <laughs> So your generation just doesn't see it the way mine does. It's true. You know, and I think there's great hope in that, yeah, actually. The, the sense of political possibility is totally expanded for us. I mean, for all the reasons that people have said in the past, I mean, like, the whatever Joe Biden says aside, like, the objective conditions of my generation, millennials and younger, are pretty rough uh, in, in terms of all the stuff we've already talked about. All right, so how much should we prosecute Joe Biden for in terms of the rhetoric of the past, his positions of the past? Not just Joe Biden, but any uh, baby boomer uh, politician. How much should we hold them accountable for what they did in the 80s and what they did in the 90s? Is there a statue of limitation, Michael, where we say, you know what, enough's enough? Absolutely not. We got to okay. call these people out on the carpet. Like you, you, you were doing some bad stuff in the 80s and 90s, and you got to call it. Come to a, you know. We gotta have a come to Jesus moment over some of this stuff. I mean, Joe Biden. You know, I, I feel like the. I, I'm I'm not trying to be facetious here. It. There's a there's a small list of things that Joe Biden has done in his political career that are actually good, and there are a few of them, you know, Violence Against Women Act and stuff like that we can talk about. But like, you watch these videos of this guy, he's like bloodthirsty. He's like talking <laughs> about we need to lock up these, you know, these teens, like, yeah. you know, and 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 it's and it's persisting today in his rhetoric, like we were talking about about you know, oh, young people need to stop whining. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps, blah blah blah. So I think you know it's totally legitimate that we. Uh, what what else do you have to run on but your record and what? what <laughs> What does it say about you that in the 80s and 90s you were, you know, screaming for us to lock up young black kids for, you know, minor infractions? Uh, and then once the the political wind, you you know, put your finger up in the air and, you, oh, the winds have changed. And so now I'm going to change. Like, wh- what does that say about you? It indicates to me that you do not have a particularly strong political compass. It's more just uh, you're flapping in the breeze, figuring out which way the wind is blowing. And there are some people uh, like Bernie Sanders who d- that's not. The, you watch those videos he's saying the yeah, exact no. same thing every year from 1980, whatever, to 2019. <laughs> yes, so, you know, that's consistent. just that. I, th- and I think people were like respond to that. Like when people see that, they're like, oh, yeah, this guy is clearly they, they respond to the fact that somebody is staying that morally consistent over time. So, you know, what what else do we want from our political leaders uh, except besides that moral consistency in the in the in the on the right Right side of history yeah and uh it, it's true and I'm, I'm i it's really fun to watch uh politicians uh try to rewrite history and try to uh, reshape what they did which is happening on a regular basis here in chicago with mayor rom like every day he's trying to rewrite something 
he did. So I, I, I get it. I'm kind of sympathetic to that point of view, although I'm sure if Joe Biden is the nominee, I will fall in line as I usually do. All right, you said something else <laughs> that I noted. Uh, I, I've fallen in line for every single Democratic. You're a soldier. I am a soldier. I am a democratic soldier. All right. Uh, you you mentioned something called the detox, detoxification of the term democratic socialist. We're going to get into that when we return. Read the Chicago Reader to get up to speed on what's what in Chicago. Culture. Food. Arts and entertainment. Weekly concert listings. Weekly event listings. The environment. Travel. I can continue, but you get the point. And for all of you Chicago political junkies, raw weekly columns on real city politics from Maya Dukmasova and our very own Ben Jarofsky. The Chicago Reader. Free to the public in newsstands throughout the city and online at chicagoreader.com. Read it now and be a more informed Chicagoan. Today's Ben Jaromsky Show was brought to you in part by Chicago Architecture Center. Get to know your city on one of Chicago Architecture Center's 65 walking tours. Hear the unforgettable secrets and stories behind Chicago architecture from our expert docents. Book your tour at architecture.org slash tours. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm actually on a tour right now. Oh, wow. Look at that building. After five years in Andersonville, Murray and White has made the difficult decision to close their doors. But everything in store is on sale. Notable sale items as well, like Veluspa and Nest Fragrances brand candles. Ben loves those. They're 20% off. He won't stop talking about these candles. <laughs> Good God, he's a candle freak. Uh, so Veluspa and Nest Fragrances brand candles are 20% off. These lines can rarely be found on sale. So while 20% isn't the largest discount, lovers of both these popular candles the lines like Ben have been buying them up. All rugs are thirty percent off in store and new orders through June first. All floor sample furniture. Oh, you should hear Ben talk about floor sample furniture. All floor sample furniture is thirty to fifty percent off. Antique furniture pieces are forty to fifty percent off. Pillows. Oh, you can't get enough pillows. At least that's what Ben tells me every week. Uh, pillows are forty percent off. Picture frames forty percent off. Jewelry forty to fifty percent off. Mirrors and wall art. Guess what? Thirty to fifty percent off. Home decor and accessories are all 20 to 60% off. Lamps, 50% off. You see where I'm going with this, all right? Everything in the store has got a discount, all right? Store fixtures and lighting is also <laughs> on sale. Once again, after five years in Andersonville, Murray and & White, a.k.a. Ben's favorite store on the planet, has decided to close their business. But get everything on discount now. The entire store is on sale. <laughs> Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show. Mr. Jarofsky, take us home. All right. Super cool music means we're coming down the end of the wire. We're not there yet. And by the way, Micah, he writes books. He does a podcast. He writes journalism. He edits stories. He watches basketball games. He also plays a mean piano. That's Micah playing that song right there. Dang, is he good. That boy can really play the piano. Some weekends took, tickle the ivory a little bit. <laughs> I love it. I don't know where you found that song, but I just love that. It's so mellow, man. It's just some sample song. I'm going to light my candles, all right? Oh, Bring out that bong and oh, have some God. good times, all right? We're not in Taylorville. Oh. We're in Chicago. <laughs> Taylorville <laughs> sheriffs arresting people for smoking marijuana. Anyway, that was an earlier show, a story. All right, before we get back to Michael, D, what do you got for me? I just want to remind everybody that uh, we're doing what we always do on the weekends, bonus interviews, yes. Penny J oh, bonus interviews. That's right, because, uh, you know, uh, between Friday, well, I'm sorry, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, we don't have a show, yeah. but we sort of do now mm -hmm. because we have bonus interviews. That's right. Bonus. So tomorrow, uh, I believe at about 6 in the morning, I think it will release, you will be able to hear from Ben's Longtime co-host of First Tuesdays at the Hideout, Mick Dumpke. Oh, it's a fun interview. What were you guys talking about? Man, we were talking about everything Rom. We were <laughs> we going through Rom, uh, the final days of Rom. We had a lot of fun uh, going at that one and uh, deciding who was the worst mayor, Rom or Daly. A couple of nerds talking politics. We love talking politics. Really good uh, deep dive into Chicago politics with Mick Dumkey. That's excellent. And also, this sound effect is uh, featured heavily in tomorrow's uh, 
bonus interview. Take a chill pill, man. Take a chill. <laughs> That's right. I forgot about take a chill pill. Take a chill pill, take man. Take a chill pill, man. It's Mayor Rump. Yeah. I just had a conversation your with you. <laughs> what? No, I don't know. <laughs> talking to you. Uh, no. Take a chill pill, man. <laughs> yeah, come on, Micah. Take a chill pill. Ben, tell us about Sunday's bonus oh, interview. Oh, Sunday bonus interview is awesome. David Ferris, one of my favorite uh, political scientists from, I have you ever interviewed him? David Ferris, very smart guy. Roosevelt University political scientist. Uh, it's, uh, it's Time to Fight Dirty is his book, and it's a, a He's advising Democrats uh, to stop playing around and be like Republicans. And we take the deep dive on a number of issues. Uh, this is a fun interview, folks. We take the, the deep dive on issues like trade, uh, abortion, uh, not only where we're going as a country right now under Donald John Trump with these issues, but what Democrats can do, what's an effective counter strategy on some of these issues. David Ferris, very smart guy. And uh, what was the other? It was trade, uh, abortion issues, and there was a third one I'm just blanking on at the moment. Uh, oh, tariffs! Oh, no, that is trade. Duh. Um, I forget what the other issue is anyway, but uh, that is uh, the interview with... Uh, uh, political gamesmanship on Biden, Iran, foreign policy, and abortion. So good stuff with David Ferris. So that'll be on Sunday and Monday. That's kind of a special day in Chicago, I guess, depending on who you ask. Lori Lightfoot will be the mayor starting Monday, and we have a little uh, Ben Jarofsky bonus interview featuring that. Isn't that right, Ben? Yes, indeed. We haven't done that interview yet. And, oh, they don't uh, need to know that. Oh, well, well giving away secrets yeah. uh just let's rewind that last thing i said uh yes uh we have interviewed uh joanna klonsky and jason mcgrath they were uh strategists for Lori lightford so we're going to break them down what it took to get Lori elected and all the good stuff they're talking what we can expect from Lori lightfoot so there you go some content to hold you over until we come back on tuesday three benny j bonus interviews find them at both chicago reader uh, website, well, Chicago Reader and Chicago Sun Times websites, chicagoreader.com, chicago.suntimes.com, or wherever else you download your favorite podcasts. Yeah, man, wherever you download your favorite. No, what do they say? Wherever you podcast. That's Take a chill pill, man. <laughs> Take a chill pill, buddy. Take a chill pill. All right. Uh, this man does not need to take chill pills, Micah. Uh, segue uh, master. <laughs> he does a podcast. Take notes. That's how you segue. Hey, that's right? how you segue, Mike. <laughs> you can you learn a thing or two. Uh, all right. The, the, what did you, a detoxification of this term, democratic socialist. What do you mean by that? Well, obviously, for much of the 20th century, the term socialism was this you know, radioactive one where it was lobbed by Republicans often to anything that smacked of any kind of redistributive or public anything, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you went to a public library, you were maybe, maybe you were a little red, you know, maybe pink, maybe. Um, you know, but certainly like national health care programs, you know, publicly provided health care programs or uh, much of anything else. You know, the, the Red Scare uh, really reshaped American politics for decades in this country. And so to be a socialist was about the worst thing in the world. And for decades that you would, you'd be very hard pressed to find uh, weirdos like me who would yeah. uh, who would claim the term it was a very small number of people who kind of kept that torch burning and they were pretty marginal in American life but of course in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis with things getting so bad for uh, so many young people especially but you know misery throughout the country and also just being you know, several decades out from the end of the Soviet Union, it's not such a scary term anymore. I mean, I think especially to my generation, you probably heard about these polls where they ask young people, you know, are, mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that capitalism or socialism is a better system? And sometimes they come out with millennials saying, you know, a majority of millennials saying that socialism is better than capitalism. I mean, just wild stuff that you never would have uh, expected to be hearing about, you know, a decade ago. So, so there's that, there's like the objective, you know, the time away from the Soviet Union uh, and can't use that as a, as a cudgel anymore, as well as worsening conditions for our average Americans. And then there was the rise of somebody like Bernie Sanders, who, you know, was very unapologetic about his being a, a democratic socialist. I think a lot of people don't really know exactly what the term means, but they associate it with things that they think are good, like uh, Medicare for all. So, um, you know, it's we're, we're in a period now where there are all kinds of new political possibilities with this just this term. So, um, you know, you have somebody like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez saying very proudly that she's a democratic socialist or Rashida Tlaib in the House, or you have the explosion and membership of the Democratic Socialists of America from, I think, uh, 6,000 members 
like three or four years ago to now approaching 60,000. Mm. These are sort of all kinds of, act, uh, of activism being done in the name of socialism. You have here in Chicago, six people who are members of the, of the Chicago Democratic Socialists of America getting elected to the Chicago City Council. So uh, I think in the next couple of years, it's going to be really interesting to see what, the, you know, all of the various things that people who are claiming that label as socialism, uh, of socialists end up doing in American politics and local politics all over the place. It, it's a new day because people are not afraid of this term anymore. All right, and uh, there will be a counterattack. Uh, so how do you suspect uh, what do you expect, I should say, uh, the Republicans will do to a counterattack uh, on this issue of democratic socialism? Well, they've already started doing it, but in a way, it's like kind of like their counterattacks, they've done it for so long and so often that it's kind of worn off. Like, uh, and, and people start to say, well, if Bernie Sanders is a democratic socialist because he wants Medicare for all, I kind of like Medicare. That sounds like a good thing. I don't really like the fact that I'm drowning in medical debt. Like maybe this socialism thing isn't a, isn't a bad idea. Or if you watch Fox News now and it's like wall to wall coverage of AOC or or whatever the big scary socialist is. And I don't know if you've ever seen this. They put like up on the screen. It's like <laughs> what these socialists want: <laughs> free health care, cheaper yeah. housing, you to live a decent life with dignity. Like it's like all these things that people see. And they're like, oh, that sounds actually pretty good. Yeah. So I kind of hope they keep up the counterattack. Uh, it's, it's you know it's putting our message out there and making us look pretty good to middle America. But you know there will be other uh, attacks. You know the the National Review just released uh, their big uh, issue against socialism. You know the famous right wing magazine, mm -hmm. the National Review. Uh, so you know there's going to be continue to. Did be you actually like read that. it? I haven't. It, I haven't read it. I read the opening editorial, but you know uh, what was what? So what did the editorial state? What uh, was their stipulation? Well, there wasn't much there. It was just like, oh, well, actually, folks, socialism is bad. It's like we thought we vanquished this this ghoul. This this this, this uh, you know this evil beast. We we thought we had slaughtered it to, you know once and for all, and that we could live happily you know in our in our uh, city on the hill uh, and and embrace capitalism and all that stuff. And now you know like a zombie, the yeah. it doesn't say all this, but but you know it's like I can't believe we have to fight all these fights all over again, which is their which is their point. Um, but uh, yeah, they're on the defense right now. It's it's socialists who are on the offense in American politics right now, and, and the the right is on the the right and the, the sort of centrist neo liberal Democrat types are on the ropes. They're on the back foot. Well, I'll tell you what, that, uh, not that I feel sorry for the Republican Party, but um, they do uh, have to deal with the issue of a, like a mixed message that they're sending out. They deal with this in the past. If you were going to scare people over social, it was, the word was communism, mm -hmm. and they would scare them with the Soviet Union. It was the great specter that uh, Ronald Reagan battled uh, so successfully in terms of his political career. Uh, now, of course, the leader of the Republican Party is uh, an ally of Putin. He's an ally of the former head of the KG or KGB operative, uh, which was the Secret Service, uh, like the CIA of the Soviet Union. So the, like an old communist spy is not only um, a political ally of Donald John Trump, who you know hacked into Democratic computers uh, to help Donald Trump be, uh, to win the election, but Donald Trump likes him and admires him and says he does. So it's very difficult to scare people about socialism if you yourself are allies with an old communist spy. Well, he's a maybe an old communist, but these days he's hanging out with billionaire, you know, oligarchs of various stripes. He's not much of a red uh, these days. You talking about Putin? Putin, yeah, yeah. And, and and Russia since the fall of the Soviet Union. I mean, just like you know, neoliberalism and privatization, selling off stuff left and right to you know get bargain basement prices and giving them away to these people who become filthy rich. I mean, it's hardly uh, communism. It's, so, the, you know, so you're you're actually now articulating the defense uh, that the Republicans will make. Who used to be a communist, but he's not a communist well, anymore. To be clear, I'm no fan of Putin. I'm just saying you can't exactly call the guy a communist. He's best friends with all these billionaires. Yeah. Well, of course, a lot of communists were too back in the day. Uh, all right. Now, Mike, uh, I just got this word that just fell from the ceiling. Where can people find your uh, find you and what's the name of your podcast and how can they find your podcast? All that good stuff. So I'm the managing editor of Jacobin Magazine, which is a socialist magazine. It's a quarterly print issue as well as daily stuff coming out on our website. Uh, the website Website is Jacobin, J A C O B I N, mag, M A G dot com. Uh, you can find the vast majority wherever you get your podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, other platforms that I don't know. The producer deals with that. Many platforms, that you, any platform you would want to listen to it on. Uh, it's called The Vast Majority. 
Uh, so if you just search the vast majority on your preferred podcast uh, outlet, you can listen to it there. Find me on Twitter. My name is Micah, M-I-C-A-H-U-E-T-R-I-C-H-T. All right, very good. And people say, hey, wasn't that other guy, uh, Jack, have been here? Uh, Bosco Sankara was here last week. Uh, you had him in town on Tuesday, and so uh, Jack has been making quite a name for itself uh, among uh, the lefties of this world. God bless the lefties of this world. A big one for a long time. Uh, Micah, thanks for coming in. I really appreciate it. We're, I'd love you having you on this show. We're going to make you a regular. How about that, D? We're going to book him again, all right? Uh, it's so much fun to have you talk politics as well. Maya was here at 2 o'clock. Romana, it was Friday, so Romana was here as well. Leanne, breaking her in, did a great job as our new uh, editor. Miles, as we speak, is in an airplane somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, or maybe he's landed. I don't know what he's doing. Uh, and, of course, the man, the myth, the legend. Take a chill pill, man. Pride of joy of Alton, <laughs> Illinois. You know what they call him down in Alton, folks? They call him White Lightning. And the ladies all love him for his body and his mind. Give yourself a raise, Dr. D. Take it out of petty cash. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you Tuesday. And remember, you can download previous Ben Jarofsky shows at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites, chicago.suntimes.com, chicagoreader.com, and wherever else you download your favorite podcasts. Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, yeah, those are a few. And hey, be sure to check out those bonus interviews. Benny J's bringing his lunch pail every week now. He's doing these bonus interviews, all right? So go check them out. We're going to post them on Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and Monday morning. We'll see you Tuesday.